We're just trying to change the world here, people. Oh, really? The Facebooking and the tweeting and the Instagramming, all that would not exist without our understanding of science. So it's amazing how you took that as an insult. You mean true for you is different from true for anybody else. Have yeah, to absolutely, because I can't think either got to be true or not. I can't, no, no. Good evening, citizens of Netlandia. Welcome back to O'Reilly Radio. This is show 153, recorded Friday, May 5th, 2017. Happy Cinco de Mayo and Revenge of the Fifth and all that. Where Oh, also the Kentucky Derby's on. I don't know, or has been on, and I have no idea who won. Anyway, it's where we dismantle the current events for your edutainment through mostly rational conversations that make you go, oh, really? I'm your host, Andy Cowan, with my usual suspects. I've got Daniel Atherton, I've got Stephen Griffith, and I have a special guest. He will be known as Mr. True Love. Welcome, Mr. True Love. Thank you so much. All right. So <clears throat> we are going to make mistakes because that's what we do here. We're normal, everyday people. So if you find one, please let us know. Send us a note at Podcast at gmail.com, or you can go ahead and phone it in at 470-222-6759. Uh, we also take, a, take texts at that, too. So just in, in one way or another, please communicate with us. That would, that would be very, very appreciated. And also a big thank you to our $5 uh, a show or a month patrons out at patreon.com slash O'Reilly Radio. That's Donald Davis, Melissa G., Henry, and Daniel Duncan. Thank you very much for continuing to support this uh, little passion project here. Uh, in upcoming news, just before we actually get into the meat of the matter, because, oh my God, this week has been crazy, we have... Uh, scheduled uh, for the show on May 12th. We have Gleb Tepersky. I hope I've said that right. I probably haven't, but I'll work on that. He's slated to join us, um, and he is going to be here to talk about effective ways to fight post-truth politics and political deception. He's an author and a, uh, uh, I think a professor. So I will, I will Fantastic. F- find out all that. Yes. Um, amazingly enough, he actually reached out to me. <laughs> to, to get on, so um, I'm oh, wait, amazed. We're by actually that. starting to get like you know notification here. Cool. Uh, maybe a little. I, I don't know. I don't know about all that, but we'll see. We'll see how all that goes. So, all right. So, Mister True Love, yes, sir. Welcome to the show. You were. You, uh, I met you at a shindig uh, at the New Year's, uh, New Year's. party mm-hmm. over at, at Stephen's house. And Daniel thought that you'd be interested in being on. And, well, here you are. And I hear that you are a more conservative-minded person. Uh, I, I think that's an accurate description. Okay. So, um, I'm, a, I'm uh, socially very progressive <laughs> and financially conservative with... Mm-hmm. Heavy libertarian freedom ideals somewhere it mixed in there. Uh, no, no, it's it's really just like glitter in in the water as a transporter. That's all it is. You know, it's it's nothing. The sparkle factor. Yeah, gotcha. it's the, just the sparkle factor. Um, Whoa, uh, Daniel, really? <laughs> you guys got to watch the video sometimes. I'm telling you. And of course, we're streaming out to Twitch. Hopefully, you guys are watching. We're also streaming out to Facebook, and you'll see all that there. This is show 153, so you can look at, look back in the archives and uh, see all the weird faces that Daniel was making. Uh, so, Daniel, well, what would you can what would you describe yourself as as you were looking at me like I had three heads all of a sudden? Um, <laughs> well, if we're going off of multiple. Um, of those delightful political spectrum tests and some of the actual academic ones. I am slightly to the right of communism. Um, <laughs> like full on communism textbook, like Marxism, like textbook. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm like a couple of steps over to the right of that. Um, because communism doesn't work in a large society. Um, paper, but paper I, versus reality kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's again in small groups you can actually have a, a communistic commune. That's what they're best for is communes. But in a actual realistic real world society, I would say I'm definitely socialistic. I believe that a society is judged upon how we treat the least of us. 
Okay. And that there's a moral imperative there. Also, I mean, if we make everything standard of living is good for everybody, then, well, we're, we're kicking butt. Okay. We can, you know, that means we're investing in science, infrastructure, and possibly getting off this rock. Okay. So you're more uh, United Federation of Planets, Star Trek Next Generation kind of. S- Star utopia. Trek is a wonderful goal. Okay. I'm, I like I'm, that too. I'm aiming, you know, my sights are a bit lower, but <laughs> that's a great thing to reach for. <laughs> reach for the stars. Okay. So that so we have we have a high high so high ideal socialist on there, okay. And Stephen, yeah. what what would you describe yourself as? Uh, I'm I am very hardcore, near militant liberal is the best way to describe myself. Militant liberal. Yeah, I, I have no problem walking hmm. to that fight when I hear somebody talking about some conservative economic or social policy, and I go, "Oh, really? All right, let's have a discussion." Um. Well, welcome We're to not the right show. Until somebody's satisfied here. Um, <laughs> no one's ever satisfied. No one's ever satisfied. That's, <sighs> but you know, I've gotten used to that. But yeah, um, I'm, I'm not going to say go. anything. There's so many openings right there, but I'm not going there. <laughs> That's what she said. There you I go. Am, I'm also a very hardcore progressive. I want to. I understand that while I am a hardcore progressive, progression for progression's sake is not necessarily good, and I understand the need for let's say, actual conservatives to occasion go, all right, that's a great idea, but hold on a second. <laughs> we need to work on this over here. Or that's a little... Not everybody can evil can evil jump the Grand Canyon. Hold on a minute. <laughs> okay. That sounds good. I, under, I understand the rationale that go, okay, that's cool, but don't stifle me to go, but this great idea. But yeah, we're going to put that in the archive and we'll, just, we'll get to that in a year. Okay, <laughs> so... So before before we get into the nuts and bolts of of what Mr. True Love believes, um, on this panel, the normal everyday folks that that we have here, uh, can we be easily convinced with sufficient evidence that we are wrong and admit it? I like to think if you give me truth, uh, truth kind of hits me over the head like a hammer. There are some things that I will firmly disagree with but if i'm in the wrong i'm in the wrong having gone through a period of my life where i was a very hardcore conservative and literally had a friend tear apart every argument i had then rehand it back to me and then show me her position and back it up with all facts and that made me a militant liberal yeah give me enough information give it to me give me the truth you might you might take a lot of it but give it to me and i'll eventually go Okay, yeah, I'm wrong. I have to change my opinion. Okay, good. So that, Mr. True Love, is the basis for the people that you're do- going to deal with on this panel today. So, so I, I wanted to make sure that you knew where what you were getting into. So, Actually, I have a qualifier for mine. Oh, no. I am oh. slightly more liberal than Eisenhower. Oh. Slightly more liberal than Eisenhower. That's an interesting qualifier. Definitely a callback. <laughs> okay. So, Mr. Trulove. Mm-hmm. Uh, Explain yourself. Indeed, no, I'm indeed. I'm All right. So, <laughs> I am, as I said, uh, I'm just, a, like you said, more on the conservative side, um, but I'm not really hateful with my views. I just see things, I guess, differently than most of my friends. We, I think we can fairly say live in a very left area of the country um, most of my friends disagree with me on most of these things and I don't blame them for it I don't immediately go out trying to tell everyone else why they're wrong um, I just, most of the time I don't say anything so I'm coming on tonight and maybe in the future because I would like to give a perspective of someone that doesn't necessarily agree with everything that's been said so far but um isn't really as extreme as some of the the media sources you see that represent what my side or you know whatever. So you want uh, to have a discussion and actually represent sane conservative views. Exactly. I, uh, I'm not trying to change anyone else's mind uh, as much as just give people perspective of what some conservative views are on these issues. When, like you said before, it's hard to really understand the mindset of people on the other side, and the media doesn't really help that because. Whichever side you are, they just always bring up the extremist points. 
So. It is hev- heavily polarized and does not do nuance very well. We are not constricted by um, uh, specific station break times and things like that, so we can go into nuance. Mm-hmm. We we have that ability here. You know, if you mention something, we'll go look it up. We got the Google machine in front of us. <clears throat> so that's box. we got the magic yep. box in front of us. We're talking on the magic box after all. So that is self evident. And, and, and so that's that's why I'm here. And I guess as to describe my views would be um I, I am concerned about society as well. Uh I am conservative, however, because a lot of times I see a lot of people rush to government to solve everything and sometimes i think it's better for us to leave government out of certain issues so that we can solve them ourselves things like that so i'm, I'm more on the small government side um a lot of times that's just portrayed as not caring about those issues though but sometimes i think government makes it worse okay well um let's see let, let me get a little a uh, little more finger pulse kind of action here so what is your your thoughts on uh, the Tea Party, now known as the Freedom Caucus. It's, um, I, I don't presume to speak for them. I th- Oh, no, I don't want you to speak I, for I, them. Exa- I want you to I, speak I'm, about them. I'm concerned them. about them. I think they were started with great ideas, right? I think there, were, there was a reason that they came out. Um, I think that a lot of the movement has turned into... Uh, from you know conservative values, a lot of it has instead turned it into like religious values. I'm trying to put that into government, and so I'm not I'm not interested in that as much as you know. But what it originally came for, um, trying to just someone say whoa, pull back on the government reins a little bit. I, I support that. Okay, so as far as um, religious freedom, I'm I'm a staunch atheist, um, mm-hmm. so I think that. Uh, Religion really ought to be out of a secular government so that the secular government can look out for everybody, including the non-believers and the believers alike. Mm -hmm. You know, the Jeffersonian wall. Um, So where do you sit on that that idea? I think religion, um, you know, and Judeo-Christian values have contributed to a lot of more of the Western governments as a whole, but I don't think that that's necessarily a good enough reason to make Christian law the law or anything like that. I don't think religious law should be in government. Like you said, I do think government's responsibility is to kind of step back and be a, just you know an earthly uh, law that, that's, that's fair and just. Uh, I don't think it has to be religious to be just. Okay. All right, so I think we've got a pretty good, uh, pretty good basis. So the big news of the week here was uh, the, oh, I don't know, what was this, the 70th uh, actual attempt to repeal and pro- possibly replace the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare. By the I way, it's no the same thing, the, everyone. <laughs> about the attempt, but uh, this, this, there was a bill that was rushed, mm-hmm. which I want to note for everybody that the majority of the Republicans in the House have signed a pledge, a pledge previous that states that they would not vote on any piece of legislation for three days. Wait, wait, what? Yeah, they were... Now, keep this in mind. A lot of these people are not the first serving terms. This was back during Obama being in the White House. But they they signed a pledge okay. that stated that they would not vote on any legislation for at least three days' worth of review. Okay, but they voted in the House, and it passed just barely. Yeah, and again, that was a violation of a pledge that they already had signed. Okay, okay, so, so, I, so that, was calling, just, that was calling them out on it. Okay. I, yeah. I'm just... Letting that be a framework because they're not abiding by their own rules, or at least their own ideals, <clears> on <throat> this specific piece of legislation. This is my shocked face. <laughs> I am surprised. No, the surprise here is you have organizations like the AMA, uh, uh, AARP, you have uh, nurses' unions, mm-hmm. um, everyone coming out going, hey guys. 
this isn't good. Even some insurance companies were on that list, you which was really also surprising. People coming after the fact, after on voting yes on this, we have already gotten in the news cycle here on Trash Day, and we're the Trash Men. Yep, Friday is Trash uh, Day. Going well, I didn't really agree with the 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 legislation, but I voted for it. Whoopsies! Or well, why I did didn't you do read that? it. Okay. Or you so didn't we, read it. That yeah, they have the got, they have the audacity to say things like that. Yeah. Um. One of the representatives from New York on the Buffalo News, um, and interviewed on CNN by Wolf Blitzer, pretty much went. Yeah, no, I, I, I didn't read it. Well, I, we know that they don't read these things. We know this. It is a polite fiction that we don't ask them that and they don't tell that outright. We know that they don't, though, because some of these bills are enormous and there have been bills that have you well, know, basically to, to, tried to, to enforce that, that whole gentleman's agreement. Yeah, we're going to read it. We're, we'll will be knowledgeable on the things that we're actually voting for. Yeah, but one of the older pieces of legislation where this came to bite a lot of people in the behind yeah. um, was the Patriot Act, which, unless yes. you had the framing of previous legislation and what it precisely changed, you had no idea what you were voting for. Um, right. A lot, of the, yeah. a lot of the Patriot Act went through and cited previous legislation and law and changed certain phrases from ands to ors, or vice versa. Right, yeah, and we've seen that because we've, we've taken you guys down the rabbit hole of many a bill and many an executive order, reading the text, trying to decipher it, and saying, wait, this is calling back to this. Okay, so what does that mean? And then having to find it, and then look that up, and then read that, and then that one's calling back something else. I mean, it is quite the convoluted process to figure out what all this means. So, And this is why you have staff. Right, that's but what staffers at, are for. <laughs> but at the same time, you, you want to have the, the, the framing of all this, and you can slip in some really toxic stuff Yeah. just by making sure that you slip in enough of those ands or ors. And let, let, let's, let's face <clears throat> yeah. it, with this AHCA thing, it on a lot of the promises from both sides of the aisle, this now, is violating a lot of principles. I mean, the biggest one is being the waiver thing for states, so pre-existing conditions don't have to be covered. Some of that is a bit of a red herring, and some of it is way worse than that. Um, just a for the listeners that, that aren't up on all the lingo, because I, there are some folks out there that treat us kind of like the daily show where this is where they get their news. Okay. Oh, I know. I know. Wait, I, I don't I, recommend I, I, it either. <laughs> hi. Um, <laughs> glad of you to join us. Thank you. Support us. Um, yeah, uh, but we'll try to be here. Yeah. We'll, 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 we'll give it a shot. But, uh, yeah. So the a H C a just yeah. to confuse things with more acronyms is the American health care act. That's, also known now as Trump Care or Ryan Care or Coupon Care or something with other this, expletives that ought to be deleted. Um, death panel care. This is one you know, where I've I, heard things I, like I don't that want today to necessarily too. stamp Trump's name on because he really hasn't read it or understands it. But this he's is the Ryan guy, Care. It it and that's we know that we know that this is his brainchild, but it's under Trump's watch. Tie the just, tanker around both their necks and throw them both overboard and see which one floats. Sim no, no, similar I, I, to how I honestly think it's it's this this is Ryan's baby. Let let's have him go with the bathwater. Well, yeah, but he won't. He won't because if I he, have to choose one. Yeah, he can this, easily this. sidestep it because he's a slick snot. I mean, it, yeah, <laughs> he's really good at that. It's all but the P ninety X. It must be the P ninety X. All those all those lifts, all those mm -hmm. lifts. Um. Just similar to how the Affordable Care Act, which was, that's even a shortened acronym, too. Yeah. Um, I can't remember what it, what it actually is. I'd have to look it up. But just like how the that, ACA. Yeah, was not written 
and penned and completely the brainchild of Barack Obama, it was patient essentially... Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Thank you. The Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Um, people seem to miss out on that whole patient protection thing. It's a kind of important, and that's what we're seeing a lot of the erosion here. But it was not Barack's idea either. Um, it was essentially a modified Romney care thing from Massachusetts. It, it, yeah, um, at which comes from even further back. Uh, we had a push by Clinton when she was first lady for universal health coverage. And before that, we even had proposals of something similar to this under Lyndon B. Johnson. Right. Yeah. It goes that far back. Yeah, it's but beyond it, that. You mentioned it's, it's you not, know, not a new modification idea. of Ryan Care, uh, Romney Care. Yeah. But people tend to forget the fact that literally it's not a modification of literally, I think, one or two or several members of the actual Romney team that built the thing for the state were yeah. brought in for the national version. Yeah. 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 To update to federal yeah. code. And yeah. they knew the nuances. But what I'm getting at here is that we stamped, you know, they stamped Barack's, you know, Obamacare on it. Yeah. And he didn't write it. Just like no. Trump didn't write this. So we're no. going to stamp his name on it. Man. I think it's fair. I feel the like the guy I at the top the ends up with the credit one way or the other. I have other. an Obi-Wan Kenobi thing going here. Um, well, <laughs> when it comes to moral high ground, that's easy. If I want to bring in a particular, see, Representative Thomas Garrett on this one, he's the uh, representative from Virginia okay. who had the response about. Um, you know, what about your constituents, the people who are in your state who are going to be negatively affected and could die with Obamacare being removed? His pretty much exact quote was, I don't care they didn't vote for me. Well, that's a little bit damning, but obviously since they didn't vote for him, it won't affect him. <laughs> These attack ads so he can say themselves, that. folks. Well, I'm I... like, he, he literally just gave up his seat at that point, in my opinion. Yeah. Okay, Go ahead. so Mr. True, True, Mr. True, True Love... I, 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 could, I could double check that. I, I think I saw that, and the actual quote was more along the lines of uh, if he was concerned among, about the protesters outside his door and, uh, and less about uh, people dying. Oh, I don't care. More about, well, what do you think these people say? Well, I don't care. They didn't vote for me. I mean, just... Yeah, the, I mean, the, the more damning one actually came off of uh, MSNBC. We know how they're kind of a little twisted, but I've got audio here. Oh, well, and video. <laughs> woman, woman who uh, went ahead of time when they were thinking about repealing this right after Trump got uh, got into office, went and actually spoke with her representative, um, informed him of her 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 need for treatment under the current ACA because she has a brain tumor. Uh, and explain the situation of the, if th this this law gets repealed, I could die. And he goes, I'm not going to repeal it. Hugs her. Mm -hmm. We know today he voted for the HC AHCA. Yeah. Which would... Well, it depends on whether or not if, he actually if, read if it. If New York waves... <laughs> Which I don't think they would. Again, I'm going to be trying to be fair here. But if it New York waived, then she wouldn't be covered. And she would likely die. There's a lot of people that are um, reliant upon the current system in place. Yes. Whatever its name is, to keep them alive. Um mm -hmm. I have a, a, a friend of mine and a friend of the show. Uh, I met her up at, uh, up at ReasonCon, and thanks to multiple medical conditions and living in nearly abject poverty, if she loses coverage, then she, uh, she is estimated that she will be dead within two weeks. And she's big on the math and doing the calculations. So, hi, Beth. <laughs> just to, just, yeah. So, <clears throat> um, 
there have been there has been a lot of hyperbole spoken about yeah. the whole thing. Uh, but essentially, what you need to know is that the pre-existing condition thing, which has been going the rounds like wildfire, wildfire. Mm-hmm. Um, essentially, as long as you keep coverage, now of course also. This is meaningless until it actually makes it through the Senate and then gets yeah. re-deliberated and then gets voted on again in the House. And then if they don't make any changes, then it will go on. But otherwise, if they make changes, which, of course, they will, then it will go back to the Senate. And then, eventually, maybe it will go to Trump's desk and then he'll sign it. Well, actually, we've gotten word from both uh, Lindsey Graham, Bernie Sanders, and I think McCain chimed in uh, as well that, they're not even going to look at this piece of legislation. They're tossing in the garbage. It's starting from the ground up, I think I saw him say as well. Yeah, yeah that, those were uh, the words. Ground, we're starting from the ground up is Lindsey Graham. Uh, it, it's going in the garbage is Bernie Sanders. Um, well, Sanders also and, said they'd be starting from the ground up. So that, that seems to be the, the mantra right now. But that doesn't necessarily... They don't have... The, the blue team doesn't have the votes to, to make that full judgment call. They can no, stall they it. do have enough votes to make sure something doesn't get passed in the Senate because a bill of that measure requires 61 votes. Uh, there are 60 well, votes, and, they do, and the Republicans do not have those the, numbers in the Senate. But the only reason they would need the 61 votes is because of the filibuster. And they can and have change the rules, change yeah. the rules to nuke the filibuster to make that go away. Or they could go through certain other avenues... I don't think that would happen with this as much. It usually happens with smaller items where they they can change certain rules where then it just goes through as a normal vote. S- simple majority. Yeah, if even that almost. I mean, it, it's, it's a real convoluted system we got, folks. Real convoluted. But with, um, with the way that the AHCA is currently written, if you maintain coverage, you're fine. Because then any pre-existing conditions you have don't count because you maintained coverage. It's all about maintaining coverage. Mm -hmm. As opposed to having with the ACA, Obamacare, where what they were trying to do was to force you to have coverage by the tax, the penalty on at the end of the year. What they're doing with this is they're removing that penalty, but they're making it so that if you ever jump off of it and have to get back on it, there's a 30% fee on top of it for the year. Also, pushing, if pushing it out of reach for most people that wouldn't be on it normally, because that's some expensive stuff. Yes. And again, if the state receives the waiver so that they don't have to abide by the ACA's rules. The AHCA or the ACA? In this bill. Okay. Um, That's the AHCA. Yeah, this current AHCA. In this bill, uh, states can get a waiver, in which case, uh, or they can either maintain the ACA rules in the state, if they so choose. Or they can ignore the ACA and they have to abide by the new guidelines of the AHCA, uh, in which case you, if you currently do not have coverage or if your coverage lapses, things like age, and, and this is where we're getting the pre-existing condition. Thing. Yeah, it goes Can't back to, to the way it was before. For price of service. You can then be priced out of the market. You still have the market there. It is available to you. You cannot afford the market. Right. Availability of the market does not... It does not mean what they say it means. Yeah, and this is where we're getting into fine legal def- definitions. Right. Um, and this is where it's, it's the stickiest wicket, because 
there's the actual law and how it will be enforced versus how it is being interpreted by some of the Republican base. As well as some of the actual representatives. It, it seems with more and more interviews, a lot of people are unclear precisely what this all does. That's not surprising. And yet we're seeing people who, you know, have groups of lawyers. I, I, again, AARP is a good group to look at because they've got the lawyers. Um, it, right, they're also yeah. one of the most significant voting blocks here in the U.S. currently. Mm-hmm. Um, going, this is bad. We don't want this. And that's why, I mean, I think I, I'll, I'll just speak for myself. I'm surprised that this got through. Because when you have a voting block that massive and with an angry memory, why would you risk it? Yeah. Um, before I say my piece, Mr. Trulove, your eyebrows were saying that you had a question, that you had things that you wished to speak of. <laughs> well, well, sure, no, I just don't mean to interrupt. Uh, but, no, no, uh, no, no, no. That is the, this, you're on the wrong show to not interrupt. You need to just jump <laughs> yeah. in. This just is what jump. this is. Just do it. Here. Hit. <laughs> Well, as, as as far as the pre-existing condition day, from what I from what I understand, I haven't been able to look at it a whole lot either. Life's been a little crazy right now, but um, I think it's if you are off for sixty some days is the, the the magic number where you need to be continuing coverage or you know at that point. Um, before the uh, Obamacare and everything went in, though. People with pre-existing coverage, uh, pre-existing exist uh, conditions, did get coverage, uh, mostly through uh, work and so forth. Insurance, I believe. Um, I think ninety some percent of people with pre-existing conditions still had insurance. It just came through work. They they weren't required to have a physical or anything in that sort of case. It's it's going to be for the right. people that have pre-existing conditions and aren't going to be able to work. The states will then, I think. From what I saw, and like I said, I'm not comprehensive yet, but there was a waiver, and they were actually putting uh, some large amount of money towards helping people specifically that couldn't qualify, I think was part of the bill Actually, as well. part of what's coming out, and we're hearing already reports from the, the, the Consumer Bureau on this, and looking over the bill, and this is part of the reasons why this was rushed, mm-hmm. was to get ahead of the report because the report coming down killed this the last time. Mm-hmm. Uh, is that that pool of money, which is given to the states to help, specifically, in, in theory, those with pre-existing conditions. However, it's not stated as such. So, more often, you are going to see the states use that money to bring costs down for those who are already healthy, putting more people in the pool to try and drive overall price down, as opposed yeah. to actually helping those in need. Well, that's, that's the economics of insurance. It is a group of people that are not all, all going to be sick at the same time paying in. Mm-hmm. So you have to have more people in so that it pays for the people that do end up getting sick and do need the coverage. And from what I understand, that's why they're actually uh, imposing that penalty, too, for the if you aren't using the insurance for a while, because otherwise it incentivizes almost not getting insured while you're healthy. And then when you're having these medical problems, if there was no penalty whatsoever, that's when you try to get your insurance. And so, you know, I mean, it's one of those... Yes, it, it, but it's really what penalty would you prefer would you prefer the tax penalty at at the 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 end of the year versus paying a penalty up front for coverage when you desperately need it um it's a it, to me it's less of a law issue and more of a moral issue because if you're pricing somebody out of care you you are going high um you're having a really hard time here uh, we, we, we understand that, but we don't care enough for you to get better. Or the alternative would be don't face in any penalty, even if it's expensive, keeping the insurance when you can so that when you are sick, you've been paying in already and you don't have to face a well, penalty. 
So the issue out- I, the issue I run into there is unfortunately, you know, myself having experienced it is okay. I have a job. I have insurance for my job. Everything else, I lose my job. Okay, whereas I was paying forty or fifty dollars per paycheck or so through work insurance, I now no longer have that income coming in. I now go to Cobra, and it's six hundred to a thousand dollars a month. Now this is before, you know, yeah, Cobra's, came Cobra's out ridiculous. I now literally can't afford it even though I'm healthy and then I get sick and then I'm just screwed, which, yeah, a lot of people, if you can get access to it through work, well, you know, yay. But also because of the way I will say this, because of the way the corporatocracy has been going, mm-hmm. it's been, we want to provide as little care as possible for as much care as possible to maximize our profits, especially when it's the, well, we can only keep 85% of it, or we can only keep 15% of it because you have to spend 85% a year. Okay, well, that just means we just charge more so that we're still making more. Sadly, this is what I've seen, and it well, sucks. And, and, and I agree. That addresses, I think, uh, a slightly different issue, though. That the the problem isn't uh, well. When are you going to get back on insurance? The problem is the insurance costs are unreasonable, and I, I and it's been unreasonable through Obamacare, like too. Because I mean, my mm. wife uses it. Those insurance costs, even when you're on the the lower bracket of things. But uh, was it? It, it, uh, can be, it can be a hard burden to pay, but you know. Is it uh, not? Wasn't it already cumbersome before the ACA as well? It was exactly. And I that, mean, and that's the thing. I think the problem is not these in, these plans. It's not the ACA. It's not the AHCA. It's the freaking insurance companies. Uh, I agree to that. That's what I. Yeah, that's the point I'm trying to get to. I, the the. We can agree on take, that. Yay. <laughs> take a sound bite from earlier today. Um, Trump met with, uh, I believe, the Prime Minister of Australia? He did. Mm-hmm. And yeah. said, your, your, your... Uh, system is better than ours. Health healthcare system is better than ours. Um, Bernie Sanders was on CNN today. It's like, thanks, they I'm going to quote you on that. They played that clip for him he laughed almost his skull off. He did. It was good. Going, by all means, Mr. President, I agree with you wholeheartedly. <laughs> yeah. Let's fix this. Let's go and just borrow what they've got in Australia. And w- while we're at it, why don't we look at some of the plans in Canada and in Europe, for that matter? Let's be number one. Let's give the people what we've promised. Yeah, it's one of the reasons I'm really for universal health care is because everybody is paying into the system. So it now becomes a lot cheaper it also for everybody. It's a universal pool. Yeah. Um, that way you're able to, ke- to carry people who have pre-existing conditions. Mm-hmm. Um, you're, you're just incorporating it into your taxes. So it's a, it's a more moralistically sound situation also <laughs> it allows the entire nation to bid and drive down the costs of health care mm-hmm. yeah. uh go ahead and i think that was a great thing and that was actually one thing uh, i was hoping that i would see in this bill but that's uh, sadly absent the one thing pr- trump was promising was you could do uh you could pick your insurance across state lines. It'd be a more open, more competitive market for the insurance things. But, um, and, and I think that had a fair chance of driving price costs down when, when the insurances had to compete with each other. But that wasn't in the yeah, bill at all. But really, either. that's that's only if you live, like, on a state line. I mean... Um, <laughs> it, 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 that, it, that promise was not researched because so much of what the AHCA... Um, and how it's formatted is by state, and the, and to a degree even the ACA is by state. It's just because, because of, of how we legislate yeah. things. Mm-hmm. Um, that doing that across state lines, well, you have to have the insurance companies be willing to do that. Right, right. And right. if you're not going to make it so that, hi, if you don't make yourself available, we're going to cost you money. The insurance companies have no incentive. It's like the the media thing where we're seeing Time Warner, Comcast, all these giants going, I promise not to compete with you, but we actually don't say that. We just do that. So I'm just reading through the actual bill 
This is House Bill 1628. Should anyone be curious and want to actually look it up, I will leave a, leave a link in the show notes for, for afterwards. And just going through, there, there's a couple things that jump out at me as I do. I work in healthcare, so a lot of this is familiar ground. This is jargon um, you understand. A bit of it, yes. So, beginning, uh, by the way, it was 62 days without coverage. And then, uh, and then for one year, you have to pay 30% more for an entire oh. year. That's oh, for, section, for just section 133. Just over two months lapse, yes. which on average to get a new job takes about three months in the current economy. Oh, yeah, current. yeah. It's, it's difficult. And... Good luck actually paying for Cobra for that long. That's, you, you, you obviously have a bigger, bigger nest egg than you think. Um, so, Section uh, 134, beginning in 2020, health insurance benefits no longer must conform to actuarial tiers, i.e., or ergo, uh, silver level benefits. Let me tell you what that means. Yes, please. <laughs> okay. As I, yeah, I see Dan's face getting, getting big, but... Yeah. Okay. What the Affordable Care Act did was, and the reason why you couldn't keep your plan was because the plan didn't meet the standards anymore. This makes it to where the insurance companies can offer bargain basement horrible care plans. Again. And market them however they like because they won't have an actuarial table that matches them to anything else. So it'll be completely disparate coverage in every state, in every exchange, in every carrier, based on whatever they want to sell you. So you can have a $20,000 deductible, um, but we make it so that you just have, you know... A, Cat the a catastrophic $30 care case, you know, that kind of a, thing. But for pharma, you've got a $30 copay on everything, but you've got a $20,000 deductible on actual care. Any number of things. I mean, it, insurance coverage in general is like when you go and buy a used car. You know, the dealership has to make X amount of money. They're going to make that money. They're either going to put it on the back, they're going to put it on the front, they're going to get take it out of you right when you come in. One way or the other, they're going to exchange that car for the amount of money they want. So they'll squeeze it here. So it looks really small. And then they'll stretch it out to like six or seven years. But they're still going to get their money. And in fact, that long they're going to get even more because you'll be paying more every year. You know, one way or the other, the house wins in these things. So they can twist the deal and make it seem however it's, however it's palatable to you. So this to the is a regulation in the bill is what I'm hearing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it, and I think that's just the tip of the iceberg because that was one sentence. But you have so, to know what the previous law that it's removing did that that just undid. Okay. So what we're going to really find out here is it when the CBO issues its report, which should be on Tuesday. Yeah. At the earliest. Um, what's. How it's actually going to affect. We're to borrow an old medical term slash military term. What's the butcher's bill? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I do find it interesting also um, that almost everything in this is after twenty twenty. That is an interesting number. <laughs> everything in this is after twenty twenty, when a lot of people right. are not going to be up for re-election. Possibly. Or if the other side wins, oh, mm -hmm. look, now you have to deal with this, and we can all blame it on you for when 2024 comes around. Timing's everything. Yeah. Now, um, of course, that may be reading too much into the tea leaves very easily. No. Because also, no. things just take time to do. I understand well, that. True, but if you're going to do a slow rollout, wouldn't you actually put it on, you know a five, eight-year rollout as opposed to a four-year rollout? Almost everything in here is even-numbered years. Very interesting. Yeah. I mean, if, if it really wasn't that telling, they'd put it on odd-number years. Yeah. When there aren't elections. 
<laughs> and it doesn't it doesn't count. Yeah. Um no, that's though to be fair, this is just how the game's played. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. The the longer you look at this stuff, the more you r- realize, oh, well they did that because of this and this and this and this and this and that's how the game is played. And it is a game. We we know that through looking at all this time and time again. Yeah, yeah there's it's just being uh, played with people's lives. Yeah, th- there's so much patient relief and health insurance market stability, whatever that means. Uh, after after 2019, here's an odd number for, for whatever reason. Okay. The bill eliminates cost-sharing reductions for low-income individuals with certain health insurance. I want to know what the, that certain health insurance is. Eliminates cost-sharing reductions, which means we will no longer give you a discount on things that we are sharing the cost of. Now, is that just with the government, or does that also include employers? It does not say that. That that is one that's actually scary. But that, em- that employer plans. Employers. Well, no, employer plans are negotiated by the employer by by the whoever is providing the job and the insurance coverage. Yeah. They're not going to. They're not going to screw people over quite that much. This is for people that are getting coverage through the AHCA. And going through the AHCA market specifically, and they would qualify under the ACA right. for cost sharing. Right. So, so the, the discounted plans and where they're ponying up X number of dollars for whatever it is based on your income level. Because what this does is it removes the income level thing and goes with an age tier. Which is what we were hearing on the previous iteration of this bill. Right. They kept that in. So older people have to pay five times the cost. Which I'm I'm someone that is that going to fly with the AARP and the what, bulk why, of the voting base. Why do you think they hate it? <laughs> I mean, that's that's just a no-brainer, isn't it? Follow the money, and the money says, no, we don't like that. <laughs> Again, that's... I, Even I a just, smoker. Under, that, that's that's for a non-smoker. I can't comprehend this. <laughs> it, I, f- I find it really telling, and, and Mr. True Love, I would like your opinion on this. Sure. Okay. I find it very telling that they specifically excluded themselves when they drafted this bill. I don't know. Uh, the people, they did the same thing for Obamacare, though. They I did mean, not. It, it, they forced them to go through it. They have to have the Affordable Care Act. Well, I mean, when they were drafting it, I remember that, and I could double check, I can fact check myself, but uh, that I believe that when they were trying to do Obamacare, they also tried to exclude themselves and uh right initially either, i think you're right yeah yeah initially they, they but, but eventually to, it, that amendment got voted down in the house and but, the Senate. but uh, in either way it's really just that's it's a uh, a non-issue i believe for both both times because uh they have insurance for life already due to their station it's not that they'll ever be on the a c h a or the a c a yeah but it also included their staffs which that's the different thing and the staff does yeah. not have lifetime with actually putting the exception in with the ACA that they would be accept, accepted from this rule. It means that the staffers would keep the ACA in perpetuity. Well, in perpetuity is is perhaps grandiose. It's not or the staffer. It's not the staffer that would keep it. It's OK. Yes. Those people are going to have, you know, our, our former senators and House members, they are going to have health coverage. What flavor of health coverage, however, that's what changed. Okay. So they no longer have the super Mercedes-Benz class. They've got, you know, an, an Alfa Romeo instead. Not to, not to say that Alfa's bad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sensing something here. It's a little bit just 
Anyway. <laughs> no, <laughs> an Alpha will break down on you. It's a lovely car, but yeah. it's going to break down on you. Yeah, it's it's not the Mercedes. That's the thing. It's not the Mercedes. I got so, you, I got you. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's it's level of care. Are they going to get it for free for life? Sure. They're going to get actually, health they coverage. Won't. Oh, did that change? I, I just looked this up. Uh, it actually came up with the uh, with the original ACA bill. Uh, requires members of Congress and designated congressional staff members to obtain their health insurance through ACA exchanges rather than continue to receive the health care coverage through the FEHBP, which the Federal Employee Health Benefits Program. Yeah. So basically, they once they the health wait, program. going through, there's a there's a lot here. I actually found this on Snopes. It's a mixture, so it's not not lie, not true. It's mixture. Right, because I think they were um, I think they were retiring the employer the federal employee health benefits program, and rolling yeah. that in as again part of the cost savings plan, because they got rid of that entire department and added it into the AHCA instead, not yeah, the AHCA ACA. Yeah. As this here in the Snopes article, the bottom line is this. Members of Congress and their staff members are required by law to purchase their health insurance through the exchanges offered by the Affordable Care Act. However, the federal government subsidizes approximately 72% of the premium cost. There is more, including like they, it's a nice they job set if you aside can get it. a Flex 125 health savings program <clears throat> and others. So and the card. Yeah. Yeah, those flex saving things. I'm not a big fan of those flex saving things, having had one no. and tried to use it and ending up not being able to use thousands of dollars a year. That's my money. Yeah, I'm uh, annoyed. I, I hate the idea of a program I put money into and now the money just literally and it's gone. Like, yeah. And, what? and you can't get it out to actually use it for the things that you're using it on I, because I, of some I weird rule. This when I was receiving physical therapy, one of my uh, fellow patients, uh, everything was supposed to go through their cart. Um, one for tracking purposes, and, and two, they've been paying into this for a while. Well, they were able to pay through the first three months of treatment. On mm-hmm. the fourth month of treatment, all of a sudden, they couldn't use the card anymore. And they were having to fight with the, the card provider yeah. to get access to the rest of those funds. I hate having to jump through so many hoops to justify the use of your own money. It's not worth it. It is so not worth it. And yet, most of these plans require you to use it. Which means you have to, you're then losing money out of every paycheck going into this savings program that all it really does is it creates a little bureaucracy over there a gatekeeper for that money. And then as long as that money, it's not in your account creating interest, it's in someone else's account creating interest. interest. It's a banker's trick. That's all it is. It's evil. I hate that. (laughs) I agree. (laughs) Hey, we agree. See? Fiscally conservative. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. That's that's pretty much... When you described yourself, I'm kind of there. I'm pretty socially liberal, but very fiscally conservative. I grew up Republican. (laughs) (laughs) But I like people too much. Okay, so. Rolling through here, I mean, what... I don't think that this is going to go through as it is. So probably whittling through it is really just... um, it, the, the things to look at, in my my opinion, on this to to b- boil it down, yeah, is CBO is going to come out next week. We're going to find the butcher's bill. Yeah, um, this was heavily pushed through to give the the, the Republican House a win. Uh, for a, a, after the first defeat, it looked like they took at least nothing else a big ego blow, and there has been some severe blowback. From the White House. Um, and so this got them a win. Hell, they put on a kegger after this. Guys. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, it was, was it was I, a party. I, I was, yeah. uh, they put on a roaring kegger for passing a bill. The thing that they're supposed to do. Um, that based on the well, pre- you know. based on the previous well, estimates, after ten years removes 
24 million Americans from health coverage. I mean, look, it's, it, I know the feeling when after years and years of you not being able to kill many people, <laughs> that it feels really great when you actually can finally, you know, get one past the, the censors. But no, it, these are it, the death panels we've been looking for. But that, that <clears throat> it, it looks like a big win. It looks like a win to the base without folks actually knowing that this is going to come to effect. And the, it puts the onus on the Senate. So those, those long-term politicians, those guys you really should hate, they're the ones that stop the thing that we're trying to do for you. Right. And I find it amusing that the Freedom Caucus is the group that didn't pony up the votes for the first pass of this thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because it wasn't bad enough. Because it didn't remove... It didn't, the, rest- they, it didn't take enough coverage away. Well, the, one of the big sticking points was they wanted pre-existing conditions or a number of pre-existing conditions, not guaranteed coverage. They thought that cost corporations and their shareholders too much money. Because a lot of the Freedom Caucus, whatever principles they had previously, has been heavily contributed to by the Koch brothers and their ilk, and they have become the new corporacrats, which corporacrat goes across both aisles. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. Money talks, bullshit walks down the aisle to vote. And the, the the big holding back thing, part of it is a principle of deregulation and small government. I will concede that. However, yeah. in its actual financial and fiscal impact it was taking less and less burden for the, the, the insurance companies and more burden by the individual and the state. It's, um... <sighs> True Love, what, what's your opinion on this? Because <laughs> well, I'm about okay. to just facepalm myself through it. <laughs> so, uh, maybe I'm just thinking too much into it, but I think... Join the club. Democrats and, and, and people on the left might have actually possibly missed a chance with all the um, with the uh, just the way they want to block Trump at every possible turn. He threw something that was kind of in the middle. It wasn't conservative enough, and he couldn't get those votes. But he was trying to keep some acts and parts of Obamacare in the bill. When it, it got proposed, I mean, to the point where a lot of the Republicans were calling it a total loss, even if it got through. Um, and the Democrats showed that no matter what, they're not going to help them. They just want to block everything as much well, as they can. And or go ahead. Part, part of the, the the Democratic block on the first, well, this last a- HCA pass was the CBO came back. Mm hmm. And the numbers of 340 million people possibly losing coverage. It, that, it, that, that's a hard pill to swallow. I don't <laughs> care what kind of politician you call yourself. Well, right, You're no, going to have that many people lose coverage? Well, see, here's the thing. Wait, you, how, you how, how big too, was that number? That they, that it might have been easier to work with them and try to change the terms, fix it, instead of blocking them and celebrating because because what you have now is well there's a republican majority in the house and the senate they have this uh, measure they're trying to take with the filibusters you have president trump in office and you have john just told him that there's no way we can reach across the aisle so he's not going to appeal to you anymore now he's going to appeal to the overly conservative sometimes because that's how he's going to get his stuff through and that's why this one got through and and that's why it's danger in the senate now what you're worried about um yeah but you know. with the um it used to be where you could reach across the aisle easily mm-hmm. enough because the the political ideological divide wasn't so vast mm-hmm. now just just the fact that you're a republican just the fact that you're a Democrat means that it's not just an aisle. There's also like several seats on either side, you know, widening that gap to where you can barely see the other person on the other side. Also, there's pickets, there's buzz saws, <laughs> there may be even a laser defense system. Only the penitent the side out. Only the penitent independent may pass. <laughs> you know, with the buzz saws, they're just going to cut them. You know, it's it's a uh, it's it's fraught mm-hmm. with danger. Um, mm-hmm. So it. 
if they did try to, to reach over the aisle, mm-hmm. just them doing that already alienates their own base. Because the concessions that would be required to, for any of them to say, yeah, okay, that's good enough. And we have eight years of Obama mm-hmm. trying, to, trying to say, okay, is this good enough yet? Is this good enough yet? Is this good enough yet? And Gun being control. strong-armed until Boehner got everything that he wanted. That was the level of compromise on the Republican side of the fence. No, it's, it's, it's um, I mean, I, I give credit to history, um, but at the same time, you have to take every day as a new day, you know, eye for an eye. Both sides have done this to both other sides, if you really want to. I mean, we can, we can talk about history. Oh, yeah. the, the extremism when it comes to the partisan politics really kicked off um, with Reagan. Mm-hmm. That's um, it, yeah. We can go. Back we can see the march era. of the colors through the through the House and through the Senate. You know, they've they've got but, the animations of that. You know, as the years tick by, the the colors get more and more divided and divided and polarized. It's a, no, and, it's, and I, it, it's I really agree neat, with that. It's, it's been going for. It's been a trend for a while. It, it's but. been going since Carter. That's really the start starting point. Mm-hmm. Um, Billy Graham, and it, yeah, it, it it starts chugging along through Reagan. It sort of recedes slightly under Bush Senior, mm-hmm. and then Clinton comes into office. And you have a man who, for some apparent reason, has ticked off a number of boxes in I hate this guy on a primeval level for a number of people on the Republican side of the aisle. Mm-hmm. And that's when it gets starts getting specifically nasty. I, 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 I mean, my lifespan doesn't go much beyond that, you know, before, um, you know, Reagan and, and, and uh, all that stuff. So, I mean... But I can say from our lifetimes, yeah, I, I, the older we get, I, it seems the more polarized things get. But the, the best thing I think we can always – the only thing we can do is work on tomorrow and, you know, I mean, we got, we got to remember yeah. the past. I'm not saying don't, don't keep account of it, but um, – We can do I mean, that. that but- it, it's why you had people that just said, never Obama. I'm never going to do anything Obama said. And now you have people saying, I'm never going to do anything Trump says. And and we continue this for the next two presidents, and we're just never going to get anything done. I mean, and that's – we can remember the past, but if, at some point, we got to take a step forward. But I you see, I, that that requires you to be progressive. <laughs> Not not I to mean, just stab you in the eye with the idea, but really, in order to do that, you have to think ahead. You have to think to the future. And mm-hmm. people that deny climate change and and don't think that, you know, scientists are actually telling the truth. Chemtrails. Yeah, exactly. Chemtrails and, you know, aliens running Vac- everything, whatever. You Folks, know. please vaccine your kids. There's a measles massive outbreak yeah. in minnesota right now <laughs> on a side note <laughs> yeah so there's thinking ahead and then there's being so short-sighted that they think the end of days is tomorrow and then you have some people who want that yes the dominionists such as ted cruz and his father uh and bannon they scare me bannon i bannon is uh i mm, you know there's words there's words there. Remember the cockroach that was in the Edgar suit in Men in Black? Yeah. yeah. He reminds me a lot of that guy. A lot of that guy. Just yeah, that's, but that's, that's, that's Bannon's not Yeah, a little bit. The, the skin's not quite on right. I'm telling you. I'll, 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 I'll give you that. It looks like there's, like, layers. Yeah. <laughs> and 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 something's off between the layers. Yeah, and let's be honest, you'd probably trust your kid more with the bug in the Edgar suit than with Steve Bannon. <laughs> <clears throat> At least you know what the bug's oh. gonna do. Oh, hey. <laughs> well, you know, he did have everything that he was gonna do on the whiteboard behind him. He did have oh, that. Yeah. that that nonsense. Yeah, that, that was hilarious. that was entertaining. I, I don't think it's a bad thing. I mean, it was a plan. You, you don't think it's a bad thing? You won't trust your kid with the guy who's in the White House? No, that's that's the, a the, no. The, the whiteboard. The, the whiteboard. 
I'm it's with him. Nice. The white track of his promises and and yeah. what they're trying to do or not. You know, it, it it the thing I think it shows if you agree with him or not is at least he's trying to keep to something that they promised and you know it's on their mind. Well, the, yeah. the, the stuff that was on the Breit Bart uh, wish list, yes, uh, he's trying to keep to that. Though that has got he had a list. On, he's checking it twice. <laughs> um, that has got him on some sort of crap list because of, of course he's. He's been pushed to the side a bit, uh, but I think the biggest thing was by Kushner. You know, yeah, but I think the, the, the biggest thing that that got him was the <laughs> I'm gonna slip me being on the Security Council thing into this because I know you're not gonna read it, <laughs> <laughs> and then getting he si- he actually signs it into law, <sighs> and then there's this giant backlash which gets brought up almost nightly, and then on Saturday Night Live. It, which is a show he hates, but he, but he watches all the time. <laughs> it's like that morbid fascination. They're going to make fun of me, but they're, they're going to talk about me, so I have to know. Preferring to President Bannon, which apparently really got under oh, yeah. his skin. Oh yeah, um, it's beautiful. And now Kushner has all the jobs. That was what I wanted to talk about. Okay, <laughs> yay segue. So Kushner, um. <clears throat> What is the what is your conservative idea on nepotism? <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't really tell you at this point. So. Okay. Oh, you you have you have no opinion on this? Uh, I, I haven't. Like I said, I've been in boxes. Uh, it just happens that the last week or so. Well, this is well, this is not the last week. This no, is this is this is this is the this last is the month. Nepotism. This is the putting somebody. Who is yep. in your family in a position of power because you can? Jared oh, gotcha. Kushner is Ivanka's husband. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and he has but, been given like all the jobs. <laughs> he's uh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not yeah. even kidding. Yeah. No, he's, I, um... he's shadowing the Secretary of State, he's in every meeting. And yet, it's actually they, a Where's Waldo. They played uh, yeah. this game. <laughs> they did <laughs> with, with with Where's Kushner. Where's Jared? Uh, on, there he is <laughs> on the, the the John Oliver program. It was with pretty much every single international meeting photo for the past two weeks, and every single one. There he is, right in the back. Or there he is. There's J Dog right behind Trump. Right there. <laughs> yeah. Well, obviously, there's the Kush. That's, that's, not, <laughs> that's not great. That's not not bueno. Just, yeah. uh, I mean, there's reasons. I, I, I agree. The family shouldn't be there. One the of family, the, jo- the whole Trump family has been. One of the jobs was uh, restructuring the federal government. There, there's that one. The one that's more. But how broad? To, toward I mean, the front of my mind is he's supposed to come up with a Israel-Palestinian peace plan. Yeah. This but, is the thing that he's supposed to do, and he's supposed to Trump broker peace to for Israel. His desk in a hundred days. That's a hundred days from his first hundred days. So two hundred <laughs> days in, we're supposed to be getting a peace plan. Now, okay. now, now, Jared's big claim to fame, his credentials, his street cred, is that his family is really wealthy, and that he's been running the family business since he was young because his dad was prosecuted for fraud. Yep. That's so. so I, I probably should clarify on one thing first off. Uh, okay, so I'm conservative. Right? Uh, that does not make me a Trump fan. There's there's a lot okay. of things that man does that makes me pull hair out. I, okay. I got a lot of it to pull out, but that's that's uh, all. That's all you have to say is like, nope, that's bad. <laughs> it's <reason> it's <laughs> it just fell right on the face. Yeah, just, boom. it just got tired, so it just ran down. <laughs> it's closer to it's closer to bottom now. <laughs> But yeah, no, I, the whole uh, with Ivanka too, just that whole thing just makes me a little bit sick. So I, I try not to worry about. It. We've it's, already gotten from the um, ethics office. Pretty ooh. much. Hi, here's this giant memo of everything that you've been violating. <laughs> Please stop. Um, 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 we've gotten a promotion of. Let's see her her book on a State Department site, which just got pulled down. That was yesterday. Um, earlier in the week, we have the, the, the Trump properties, uh, being promoted. Uh, there's still stuff that 
the family is doing with their um, building plans in Manila in the Philippines. Uh, that's part of the reason why Trump went, oh, I'd love to have Duterte here. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and meet the guy who is killing, you know, 70,000 of his own people in this insane drug war and goes to, to members of his local press. Um, remember how you cover me because you're not exempt from assassination. That's a quote. Yeah, just remember, we fight a drug war. He's fighting a drug war like 1980s Rambo Arnold Schwarzenegger a la Commando. I will pardon you if yep. you kill someone who possesses drugs, is a dealer, or is a suspected dealer. Yeah, it's kind of hardcore. Yeah, and, and that's somebody that he's, he would be honored to meet. Honored. honored. Um, that has absolutely nothing to do with the, the, the tower plan in Manila whatsoever. It has nothing to do with it. Oh, but, but, oh. By it, the way, we just got the, the, is, the, the, the approval to break ground. Is he planning that, on doing that? that? Is he building another Trump Tower or something or other over there? Another Trump Enterprise? No, th- th- there's going to be a dual tower complex uh. in Manila. So, okay. so he's... Tweedledee and Tweedledum of his sons just went over there. Like a month ago. So he's very specifically profiteering from his role in the, in the presidency. Yes! So that whole emoluments I mean, clause I, thing. Uh, again, we, 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 have, we have at the meeting with uh, Xi Jinping, he gets 30, 30 trademarks passed after that meeting. Coincidence? He gets a bunch of. Uh, <sighs> Banca has just written. There's an awful lot of coincidences marks. happening. You know, this is where you go to the crazy board on the wall and you yeah, you start running the means, running the red yarn the to here and here and here. It's like you um, know, maybe, <laughs> maybe there's something the to this. Is, the guy is getting trademarks through. His daughter's getting trademarks through. Um, yeah. Things, oh, and, and, and of again, course, Kelly these were things Conway that Trump and... has been wanting for a long time because China has been a market he's been wanting to tap into, not just for labor but for actual sales, and has been something because China, for the longest time, does not like agreeing to to foreign trademark. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I want to ba- I want to back up a, a second. Contentious thing. I want to back up a second. Back to to Jared. Um, I a- I asked the Google machine, "What is Jared Kushner's job in the White House?" Okay. Oh. The very first thing is a Fortune.com article. Jared Kushner, here are all his jobs at the White House. The very next one is from CNN, Trump's Secretary of Everything. <laughs> <laughs> That's a headline. You're Washington, going to click that. Washington Times, Jared Kushner, Donald Trump's son-in-law, runs the White House. <laughs> Jared, be careful. Just, he doesn't like that. Kushner. <laughs> And fifth down, Kushner has a singular and most almost untouchable role in Trump's White House. Yeah, um, I do all the jobs. He does all the jobs. He does all the things. Um, he's the um, he's the senior advisor, Trump's senior advisor. Okay. Uh, he's also uh, head the white. He's head of the White House Office of American Innovation. Uh, which is designed to rework the government okay, using inspiration the government from the thing. using inspiration from the private sector, which has no business in government because government's a different entity. They have very different ideas for what well, is again, success. C- corporate's great when you're trying to make profits. Yeah, mm. uh, corporations aren't really good at infrastructure because. That is profit that you're not going to see for maybe. years. Well, maybe ever. If, or ever, or decades. Yeah. It's not going to give your shareholders money now. Um, how Infrastructure old? is the role of government. Uh, g- gentlemen on this panel, sound off. How old are you? I'm 30. I'm th- about to be 34? 38. I'm 39 this year. Um, Give me a few months. Okay, I'll be there. Jared Kushner. How old is Kushner? 
29? 29. 31? No, no. He's a little older than that. A little older than 31? He's older than 31. Okay, 35. well, I did go over. 35. Drill off. Mm, um, Closest to the pin. Hmm? I'll say 33. 30, no, he's 36 years old. 36. And he's essentially running the government. That's not bad, since the framers did put in that, you know, you got to be 35 to be president. So at least he met that number. Uh, <laughs> it's just he wasn't necessarily voted upon by, by the electorate. Right. Uh, the the whole appointed. reinventing government thing, a little bit weird. Uh, he's, of course, being the shadow diplomat. You know, just being there in the, the room as everything else happens and having a well, say on it. Considering that Rex Tillerson is a gaff machine, <laughs> um, might as well have a backup. You know, all things considered, Tillerson could be doing a worse job. He could be doing a worse job, but he could be doing a much better job. I mean, the, the handling of China has been contentious at best. Where he just had a, had a tummy ache and didn't show up? Um, he, his, his dealings and, and comments with North Korea have been inflammatory. Let's just call it as is. Mm-hmm. And he has not been trying to do as going to Clinton, who was actually kind of a big figure with North Korea due to the fact that he was actually as sitting president when, uh, Kim Il-sun passed, he actually sent a, a fine letter to Kim Jong Il um, sending him condolences. He was actually one of the few Western leaders to do so and that was part of the reason why he was in when they were holding on to uh, I think a couple of our journalists or some tourists that were of American descent. Mm -hmm. Uh, Clinton was sent over there um, while Obama was president while this was going on and was able to secure their release. Uh, but again, that's the idea of for, forethought and diplomacy. Again, try and be humane so you make inroads. That's the part of playing a diplomat. You don't want to be the guy thumping the table. That's, that's for somebody either higher up or underneath you. You're the person that when those people raid, rattle the saber, you're playing the good cop role going, Ignore him. Let's talk. Okay, so enough about J-Dog. <laughs> um, the House did pass something uh, this week that, uh, that has myself... Positive ramifications? No. Damn it. No, 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 I'm afraid not. Um, it's, it's definitely very okay. much geared for, um, for the employer versus the employee, though, which is... Uh, Something oh, that we're that, fairly that. used to uh, used to seeing out of this administration's ideals so far, being that he's an employer and has never once been an employee until now. This um, was the first job he ever applied for. He's got a great average there. I will say that he's batting a thousand. He ran for the job and he got it. I will. I will give that to him. Absolutely. Um, beyond all all comprehension and odds, he did. Um, so it's uh, they, they pass something about overtime work, overtime pay. Yeah, uh, David. Bad. David wanted desperately to chat about this. Uh, he's he was on a plane though, so he couldn't join us. Um, so the measure backed by Republicans would let employers offer workers paid time off instead of time and a half pay the next time they put in extra hours. The vote tally was largely along party lines, with no Democrats voting in favor of the bill. Six Republicans also voted against it. GOP leadership has touted the legislation calling the Working Families Flexibility Act. So you can look it up by that. The Workers... Working Family... The Workers Party... No, the Working Families Flexibility Act as an attempt to codify flexibility for employees. They say it would be illegal for an employer to coerce an employee into accepting comp time in lieu of overtime pay. Uh-huh. <clears throat> um, 
I have. Um, I got a, I got a few things to say about all that. Uh, given that in my current job, uh, this week I worked fifty two hours. So that's a lot of time and a half time. Yeah, that's enough where it actually matters. Oh yeah. Because so, if it's forty five or lower, it doesn't make that big of an impact yeah. on your paycheck. If it's okay, I worked forty one hours. Yeah, give me that one hour back as a, as vacation time, a comp time somewhere. I'm mm-hmm. I'm kind of okay with that. But what this does is it allows them to screw me out of a whole lot of money. Given Uh-oh. that the amount of vacation time that I have every year, I still don't use and lose money on it. What do you think? I think this is a giant win for corporations. Um, they're the ones that are going to see the most benefit. Um, it can benefit small business, which may have been its original intent. Um, because time and a half is costly for small business, especially when they're growing in a struggling economy. Um, but who's going to use this? Walmart's going to use this. Okay. And those, that's taking a lot of money out of people who don't make a lot of money's mouths. And, oh, look, when you start taking a little too much of that paid time off, we already know there are abuses. There's going to be a problem there. Again, along those lines, is that's where you hit the... Here's where, economically, you hit a very interesting crossroads. And it's a very bad crossroads to be on. You hit this, okay, yeah, instead of doing overtime pay, we give you pay time off, combined with right to work, like you just mentioned. We can just you, fire you for it's whatever. A, it's that, yeah, we can't pressure you to do this. We can't, you know, do this whole thing. You can put your money in there. We can't tell you that you can't take the time off for everything else. But if you do, they can always just eventually, especially you take too much of it, or you don't do this. But the, the company's really pushing for you to do this whole thing, not do the overtime, do the shift to pay time off. Cool. But you don't. Well, clearly you're just not part of the corporate spirit and corporate environment. You're just no longer part of the team, and there's no real fit for you here. Thank you. Goodbye. I have seen stuff like that on firing paperwork. Yeah. You know. You've also seen, again, the, my fear is, okay, this passes. Yeah, you have that, that, that story. You have somebody who actually opts in for for the paid time off. And you're taking too much of it. Right. Even uh, though it's your time, even though it's during your time the holidays cuz you're 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 saving up for that. And it's not on necessarily that, you know, Christmas week thing. No, you make sure that you go in. But in that, you know, time right or after Thanksgiving, you take, you know, you try and put in for two weeks because you want to actually spend time with family. Yeah, you just time, no, you basically just okay. time shift your holidays. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's very interesting. I'm, I'm, you know, I always try to stay away from knee-jerk reactions. I haven't seen this one too much yet. I'm not as quick to say it's a bad thing. Um, there's a possibility of abuse, um, but we're also... A, I mean, we've all had that jerk boss. We know how some people are, but the the spirit of the law, it seems, you know, you hear all these complaints about the the six hour work day in other places, uh, how people aren't home with their kids enough. It's making an alternative that you don't have to opt in. You know, there's we're I think the things we're worried about are people taking advantage of this sort of system, but I don't necessarily think it's all bad as it stands already. Well, the other problem I can see in this, because my job has this issue, and I know a lot of other places have this issue, where you can only, you opt in, so the, instead of overtime hours, it's going to, you get PTO. Cool. But you can only carry over so much PTO per year. Mm-hmm. So I did, I did a little digging. Not taking the, taking the vacation or any of that, you're literally just leaving money on the table. You're handing it back to them, and you're not getting paid for hours you worked. 
mm-hmm. straight out. No, also, I, I, how does this affect uh, uh, severance laws? That's a good question that is not addressed at all. Now, one thing in here, um, as you continue to dig, because you have to, because all it is is just like a cursory glance, and then, you know, you got to dig a little more. Uh, the comp time would actually be, for every hour you spent in overtime, it would be an hour and a half of comp time. That's, okay. that's written in. So that's cool. That's positive. That's cool if you're going to be able to ever take that comp time. You know? Yeah, it's keeping equal. So. Us, okay. th- those of us that have been in the work field for a long time know how employers kind of work that, and we've, we've talked about that a bit. So the likelihood that you're actually going to be able to take the comp time, that's, that's up in the air. That's up in the air. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So I find it interesting that what they're saying in it is that employees can opt in to taking the comp time or they can opt to take the overtime pay. Mm-hmm. Either or. So, yeah. so that, yeah, it's, it's the option there. So it, it, it really right. is going to, de- to depend entirely on how it's implemented. But just by the, the, the as intended of the law, it's, I think, overall Good. I'm worried about how it's implemented, you know, and it's always fair to be so. Like, give it time to see how it pans out. Um, and I wonder if that's going to lead to further uh, cases in the future about companies letting people take time off because now, for example, like you said, I've already known people too that have lost paid time off. They didn't use it all by the end of the year. Mm-hmm. But um, so oh. if that's how they pay you and then they don't let you use it. That, I've, that brings a whole other thing. I've seen companies end. that give you the two weeks. You know, they give you a two-week vacation. But if you take more than two days consecutively, then you're taking too much time. Yeah. Also, uh, beyond that, looking at this, it, just a quick observation. Something like this, a company that adopts this policy also can simply go, we no longer, as a company, offer standard PTO. Flat out. So you, ha- so you have to work overtime in order to get you want your PTO. PTO. You work overtime to earn oh, your PTO. Oh, that's a dark, dark turn. Ouch. I can see that in a heartbeat without a problem. Oh, I did not Actually, see that Actually, at one place that I previously worked, I only worked there one day because that was just a nightmare. Um, that's bad. One day yeah. in a walkout? Ooh. I, it was just, hi. Oh, I, I, didn't, I went at the end of the day, this is not going to work. And I, from the foreman, I got no complaints. He was just like, okay, bye. Mm-hmm. And that was a place where you didn't get PTO until you had five years in. Five years? Yep. Also, did, you did you also have to, have have to buy your clothes at the company time. store? <laughs> Wait, what was that? What was that about overtime? Uh, you had to work mandatory overtime. Uh, they're I've, I they're had those. expecting I had those jobs. you to to take at least twelve hours mandatory overtime a week. You know, mandatory overtime. That's a, that's a funny kind of thing. But yeah. Hmm. I uh, yeah. in college I worked as an artificial rock sculptor. Interesting job. That was cool. Interesting job. Um, I, I actually was carving some of the big, uh, icon rocks out at, uh, Jurassic Park for Universal Orlando. Um, interesting job. Very interesting job. It was, however, mandatory six days a week, 10 hour days. Mm-hmm. As construction in 110 degree weather that summer. And of course they'd already cut down all the trees, so there was no shade. Yeah. It was, it's a bit of a rough job. Bit of a rough job. Uh, there were 5,000 people a day on that construction site, and 10 of them died of heat exhaustion over well, that summer. I live that, guys. The next time you go to Universal Studios, I survived. Yeah, I, Islands of Adventure. That's, you know, it has a death toll <laughs> before it even opened. Um, so, I- interesting, interesting ideas. Uh, yeah, I, d- I didn't get any time off on that job, but I also wasn't looking for it because for me it was just a summer job so i wasn't really looking at all yeah, that but mm-hmm. again i can see where this is a positive for yeah. small business but yeah there are so many ways this can be abused uh the big concern is how this affects severance um 
because do you get all that that pay time off? Probably not. It would probably go yeah. into a comp bucket that yeah. would not be eligible for payout. Which I know that that was a contentious enough thing with my mother where she sued her former employer and won to get that that comp time. Um, and this this seems like a place where it will be abused heavily. Uh, and again, if it's I don't think small business is going to abuse this. The people who are going yeah. to use this properly are going to use this properly. Yeah. It's when you're dealing with large corporate entities that have the lawyers to go, go ahead, try. Yeah, and there's also going to be those shady people that you probably shouldn't be working for anyway. Mm -hmm. That's fair. I too. mean, that's, they're, they're going to do things like that. They're going to pay you under the table. They're going to get around every worker's law and, and everything that they possibly can anyway. So this is just yet another thing that they have to get, that they, they'll scoot around, or they'll hide behind it in certain cases and get away with murder. But, you know, maybe we're jaded. Maybe we're just so <laughs> jaded by everything that we've seen week in, week out here, that we can only see the negative in that. I'm, um, I'm actually looking at the law, too, just to, because, you know, a lot of the, like you said, dig in cursory glance, you know. It's hard to say, but with the actual it's, law, uh, it's going to cover. HR, it's, it's, HR 1180? Uh, yeah, I'm on the yeah, Congress, just HR uh, 1180. But uh, So this was passed in the House. It is, I'm guessing, being considered by the Senate now? It has been received in the Senate as of 5-3. Okay, so it is under consideration now. Yeah. Um. I wonder if he'll be just immediately out onto the Senate floor for debate or if they're going to pop this one in committee for a while. Uh, let's see. The committee is House Education and the Workforce. Uh, that's where it was introduced by Republican Representative Robbie Martha in Alabama. Hmm. Don't actually hear a whole lot of things coming out of Alabama. <laughs> Actually, you hear plenty if you follow their, their news, uh, considering their governor just got uh, forced to step down. Well, I mean, things in the House. And, oh. <laughs> I know they're busy. They're busy there, but, you know, when they oh, bring it on the... There's tons of busyness in Alabama right On now. the big stage. It, yeah, it's a little different. Hour limit, maximum hours, compensation date, excess of 80 hours, uh, written requests, private employer actions. This is the kind of thing. Oh, termination of employment. An employee who has accrued compensatory time off authorized to be provided under paragraph one shall, upon the voluntary or involuntary termination of employment, be paid for the unused compensatory time in accordance with paragraph six. And then that yeah, paragraph six, six is the rate of compensation. And then okay. there's several uh, subsections for that. So general rules and consideration of payment, any payment owed to an employee under this subsection for unused compensatory time shall be considered unpaid overtime compensation. So comp time equals the same rules that are already in place rate. for overtime compensation. Well, that's good. I just see this actually being on a, a thing that I'm glad An they put that in. player will try and get around. Of course. And you may actually see a suit of a company against the government to get around having to pay this. Yeah. Anything jumping uh, out at you? Oh, and one other thing, too, is... Um, so, like we said before, sometimes you just don't get to use your paid off time off in a year. Yeah. But uh, by January 31st... And this is uh, just the... Paragraph, uh, it's out three under hour limit compensation date. If okay. you don't use the paid time off that year, you still get compensated for it at the end of the year instead. So it doesn't oh. build up. So it's um, so, so if you don't use it by the end, they pay you out regardless. Hmm. Well, I only get paid out a percentage of mine. Uh, yeah, I know my mother's the same way. So well, I, I think the, the paid time off that's normal versus this overtime is probably in a different bucket. I would I would guess and it it seems they have to reimburse you 100 percent of the value for for overtime time off. That would be interesting. So, not later than January 31st Especially of each calendar year. Okay, so 
the employee's employer shall provide monetary compensation for any unused compensatory time accrued during the preceding calendar year that was not used prior to December 31st of the preceding year at the rate prescribed by paragraph 6, which is their normal compensatory rate. Uh, so that is the overtime rate. Uh, An employer may designate and communicate to the employer's, to the employer's em employees <laughs> a 12-month period other than the calendar year, in which case such compensation shall provide not later than 31 days. So basically, if, if, your, um, if your fiscal year starts in April, for instance, you could go April to April. So it yeah. looks like they have a few good protections in there to make sure exactly what y'all are worried about. Just the yeah, it, it's harder for them to 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 stick it to you with this sort of thing. It looks like they've actually well thought this through. Maybe sometimes small thing, small miracles happen. And um, I'm I'm a little but, surprised. I will not but, use this <laughs> because I already have all the vacation time I need. So just give me the money. <laughs> But I could see other people that haven't worked for a company long enough to, you know, amass the amount of vacation time that I have. Because I've got like five, five or six weeks now. I don't even know because I never use it. That's the thing. I, I never end up using it, but I have it there. So I always get paid out at the end of the year. You, you, you almost actually have, you know, European holiday levels of pay time off. Yeah, but when would I be able to take it? There's too much work. Because I'm an American. <laughs> and I don't have enough people to, to back cover me. So if I took the time off, then they'd be driving my van around, screwing up my inventory, and then I'd have to come back and fix everything. Anyway. <laughs> that's yeah, Well, then you, when you're coming back to fix everything, then you get the more overtime and you replace your time off again. So right, yeah, like and the, then it's vicious. <laughs> it's the snake that eats itself of overtime and comp time. Yeah, it's, it's just weird. Uh, but yeah, so in... In my position, I've got enough already personal time that I wouldn't ever need it. Mm -hmm. However, somebody that's just starting off, somebody yeah. that's just, they've made it past their 90 days, they're now eligible for comp time, they're eligible for PTO, they get two weeks, and but it builds up over time. So you don't have all of it at once for some, for some employers. So... In this, they're going to work you like a dog, and you end up with some comp time at the end that you could actually then take the time off to recuperate, in theory. All I know, all I know is if I'm an employer, I'm changing my fiscal year. Most of them already changed their, their fiscal year. I, anyway. I, I would have my fiscal year starting in August. Oh, so they couldn't use it at the beginning of the year as much. Ah, uh, I see. As as far as retailers would be concerned. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh yeah, that's clever. That's something I see happening a lot. Hmm. Um, because again, uh retail turnover usually happens within the first four months. See, now you've given the game away. So anybody listening to this podcast is now going to know that if they're if they're working in retail, they need to change their fiscal year. <laughs> to be fair, I think my last retail job, our year was July to July anyway. So it's it's a uh, yeah, it's right in there. It's out of the bag. It's already it's out of the bag. Old, that was old thoughts. Me. Old thoughts, but uh, but valid. <laughs> so I'm less concerned about this if it was. Oh. If if it had not been voluntary, based on the employee, mm -hmm. then I get, um, it's right out. No way. It, I I feel like there will be places where you will be pressured into this, but the one right. thing that I see as the big protection is the forced payout, because nobody wants to do a lump sum payout because that just impacts too hard too heavy on any specific quarter you want to pay out in small doses you don't want to have to deal lump sum right because you can budget for that you can't budget for the big balloon payment at the end as well yeah no so. like uh, yeah kathy works you know 50 hours a week every week 
she hasn't taken right. any PTO off. It's like she's accrued she, all this. S- sitting there with 150 hours of, uh, of, oh, wait, no. So remember, for every one hour she's, she spends over, yeah. it's, a, it's an hour and a half. Yeah. So, so she's got 10, hour, 10 hours a week of, of so overtime. So 15 hours so 15 of comp hours, time every week. 15 times, times 52. Are you yeah. paying that out? Yeah, yeah, no. That's what you'd have to do. Yeah. That, that is a they wouldn't, nightmare and scenario. They would and then you'd have to sue them. <laughs> because that's how a lot of these businesses work. Well, they would probably, in a right-to-work state, that's where you get the canning. Yeah. Is you've accrued so much time, we can see where this is going. Right. So through, at, no, at, through no fault of your own. They've forced you to accrue that much time. They haven't let you take any of it. And through simple fear that you will end up needing to take it or they'll have to pay it out, they put it as one of those mythical strikes. So you get called in the office and you've never been called in the office before. And all of a sudden you have three strikes on your record. How did that happen? Well, you got them all that, that very second. Because of this, because of this, because of this. Welcome to the right to work state. You're fired. Yep. So they pay out a smaller lump sum right. than the giant lump sum that they were anticipating. And they probably have some thing in your contract where you are forced to go through arbitration. That that is that is happening less so because a lot of lawyers no, it's are go, no, it's going on up. that. No, it's going up. Really? Yes, it's going up. Oh, man. Because arbitration is as binding as a court. Let that be a lesson to you, folks. Don't sign anything that does that. But the thing is, if you're hungry for work, you're going to sign anything they throw in front of you. Fair enough. Yeah. More importantly, always read every line of a contract. This includes employment. Know what you're signing up for so yeah. it doesn't surprise you. If mm-hmm. they try to force you, it's like, no, you have to sign it right now. Walk away. Yeah. Walk away, because that's, that's not the kind of pressure thing that you want to be involved in. Go, no. go take it Take it to a, a paralegal. Take it to a friend. Take it to a third party to read through with it. Take it to us. You know, people like us, where we're, we'll read through these things and just randomly say, oh, that's what that means. Just, you know, go have a drink, take a nap, whatever, look at it again, and bring it back. Mm-hmm. Say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need a day to, to, to read over this paperwork before I can sign it. Period. Okay. I, I'm not flexible on that. I'll, I'll bring it back tomorrow. It's true. Yeah. Devil but, is the again, detail for those yeah. kind of things. Yeah. The, the, again, on the surface, this law actually looks solid. It is more our concern with how corporate America is going to use it and abuse it. Exactly. It's, it's less the law. And how the law will be manipulated. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that's really most of our theories on all of this stuff is, for the most part, does this help the business? Yes. That's why this thing got drafted in the first place. Because there was, it, a, it, there was a business again, interest for this to exist. It, it's a very strong small business interest. I have to say, mm-hmm. this feels like a small business law. Because being able to do PTO instead of of, of playing that overtime, yeah. that, that is easier a, a feat to schedule around. That, yeah. that is a, an, an easier pill to swallow. Um, and, and if you can anticipate with enough time when someone's taking that time off, it's not going to have as dire an impact on your business. But if you're trying to grow, especially within the, that first three-year period, this mm-hmm. could be a godsend. Uh, I can see this being a giant godsend for you know anybody who's in food service that's yep. starting out. Because no, you're you're it's a small margin that oh, they, yeah. or a profit. So being able to do just PTO, that's. That's so much better. Especially when 
a lot of companies are no, you cannot have overtime, but we still mm-hmm. have, to, but we still have to have the job done. Mm-hmm. So even in big businesses, that happens all the time. You know, at at my place of business, who I'm not going to name for reasons that I'd like to keep my job, uh, there is a division that is customer facing, and they are not allowed to get any overtime. So they basically would then have to clock in late the next day or, you know, they'd have to flex their time out around Mm -hmm. that. This this kind of rule would allow them to accumulate more vacation time, which they would be able to use because there's enough staff there to cover the time. Mm -hmm. And they'd be able to take more time off and, and do that. So I could actually see this working even in my... 50,000 employee company Mm -hmm. and making people happy. I I think Uh, so too. I think one of the strong suits of it was it, it helps, it gives the option because I think, like you said, employers big and small have already been doing this, right? Like, Hey, work an extra hour today off the clock. You can come in an hour late tomorrow. Like we'll be between you and me. This gives them a, on the books way, a legit way of handling that sort of. um, So I, I only see it as, it, it keep it, you definitely have a point in keeping it more above board. Yeah, because uh, that was and, one of the things they said was codifying an, an already in use practice into law. Um, the other thing this actually can really help is our health industry with nursing mm-hmm. and, oh. and and orderlies in general. Oh yeah, but you know what? They fall into a different category because they are also uh, one of those necessary services. So when you deal with healthcare workers, especially when they're frontline, like ER personnel, uh, when you deal with police, when you deal with uh, any emergency operators, uh, fire, fire search and rescue, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, those are services that they don't get overtime in many cases because of other rules that are in place. No, I, but my so, father was a cop. He got he got plenty of overtime. It depends. It depends. That's on a day to day basis. Depending on the emergency that's going on, those laws can be suspended rather quickly. So, but that's a gray area. That's the exception, not the rule. Just okay. people that are in those jobs, be aware that. If you're the kind of person that could be called in on Christmas, then these kind of laws may not really, in practice, Applies apply to you. To you. <laughs> that but kind of thing. No, I, I think this has a definite positive. It's just the, the, the dark and, and terrible things are what already is dark and terrible in corporate America. Yeah, so, so the, the monsters that were hiding under the bed about this bill... They were already there, and they were just waving at you. <laughs> <laughs> well, can we get to my dire fear this week? I believe that we certainly can. And then we'll, we should probably go ahead and wrap it up as, uh, as okay. we've certainly uh, uh, popped Mr., uh, y- your, your cherry on podcasting this yeah. week, definitely. Um, this is your first so podcast, right? Hope it's been fun for you. <laughs> is this your first podcast? You with a little bit of, well, the other side is just as evil. Um, <laughs> let's talk about the DNC. Ah, uh, uh, yes. The Democratic National Committee. And the current lawsuit going on here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Um, Isn't that the, where, where uh, uh, Wasserman Schultz hails from? I'm not entirely certain where Debbie hails from. It may be Fort Lauderdale. It may be the fiery pits of uh, <laughs> Baycor. I'm not certain. Um... <laughs> I believe so. <laughs> You're not wrong, sir. Okay. <laughs> She's a representative but, for the twenty for the twentieth district. Actually, sorry, twenty third district. She was originally born in New York City. Uh, I live in I lived in South Florida for a while. I remember that being. But yeah, this is a suit ongoing uh, in the Southern District of Florida, case number one six dash six one five one one. Dash CIV dash WJZ. Yeah, that's Carol not good. Wilding You're going to need to shoot a link over to me. 
<laughs> Shoot a link over to me for that one, because yeah, that that's that's the kind of thing that's nope. <laughs> Carol Wilding that? at Law versus DNC Services Corp, Democratic National Committee at Law. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that th- th- this is something that has been bothering me for a while because. Tell us it didn't about even it. get put out on Trash Day last week. It it it, it was it was put in um, on Saturday, I believe, of last week. Uh, you know, I'm I am if I just punch in DNC lawsuit into the <sighs> Google machine, it comes up. It's, it's it's not uh-huh. hard to find. It's being covered. DNC argues it had the right to rig the 2016 Democratic primary. <laughs> Pretty much, they're they're saying that that the reason why this case should be dismissed is that their charter is not something that can be enforced upon them by law. It is something that they are electing to follow. It is a guideline. It is not a law. And so they cannot defraud anyone who gives them money towards their process because in actually doing a primary, there is no law on the books that it has to be democratic and or fair. So so if they choose to ignore their own rules, they're, that's allowed, on, to they, their they're rules. allowed to do that. And there's nothing that you can say about it. So leave us alone and we do what we want. Yes. That's essentially the argument that is being made by their lawyers. Is that if they choose to ignore their charter, well, that, that is something that they, as an entity, can do. It's their charter. <laughs> okay. See, the, court, the case that I saw from it was that uh, they're actually being charged with uh, with fraud because of yeah. people donating to right. certain causes and then being told that it was basically false advertising and, and stuff if it wasn't a fair election. Right, uh, but their, their, uh, their argument that they aren't guilty of that is that, well, it's our charter, we made the rules, so even if we'd said that we weren't going to do that, then we still don't owe any penalties because we changed the rules in the middle, Calvin Ball style. Yeah, it, it's... A lot of this is coming from people who donated to Bernie Sanders' campaign or donated to the DNC uh, in in hopes of either Bernie or for any other Democratic candidate. Because a lot of these fundraisers happened with Clinton alongside the DNC. And here's the nasty bit of news. Clinton got to choose how much money she took from that fundraiser and the DNC got the scraps. Shouldn't it be the other it, way around? It should be the yes, other way sure. around. Actually, just guessing by there. their charter, it should be the other way around. And no, the <laughs> DNC was essentially acting as part of Clinton's campaign arm before she got the nomination. Well, given that they were being run by somebody that was her campaign chair previously, <laughs> it's kind of an easy no. thing for them to just fall right into, wasn't it? And, 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 and my, my big problem is... If this were, say, in the 90s, this would be getting wall-to-wall coverage. This thing right here. Mm-hmm. It's getting buried. Well, they're not, they're not the party in power. Therefore, they're not the ones that are important to the news media. I don't they're care. They're the side This show. is massive fraud. <laughs> yes. I think, I think any... any sidestep from with a lot of the media sources though feel almost compelled to just say how horrible the Trump administration is every day and any any from what I've seen anything regarding news on big politics like that is quickly turned into well you're not focusing on the real issue which is Trump right like that that's how a lot of these things get pushed aside. Uh, this is definitely something that's being pushed aside. Uh, like MSNBC, are they really covering this? No. Um, this CNN, is. Um, I think they did a small blurb, um, and they're waiting to hear back on the ruling from from the judge, who I cannot blame him. Has gone. I need a recess a long time on this one. 
in uh, in newspaper speak, this would be page two. This, is, this yeah. is not this is not front page news. It's it not page it's not page news. three either. You know, it's it's not the stuff that's going to be super buried, but it's also not going to lead. It's because easy there's other to lead stuff. with, though. You have so many people who hate Clinton and and Wasserman Schultz already. Right, you can get traction with this story. They're not using the story. Now, what I'm surprised about, and I know that you've been you've been trying, Dan, to to get this in front of other people's eyes. You've been you know sending it up to to the Times and everybody. You know who you need to be doing doing this to? You need to be tweeting it to Donald J. Trump. Because okay. then, be, I no, be, because I then need to hand this to the devil, but no, no, okay. because no, no, then no, you tweet it. That's you the tweet it to him, and all of a sudden, he has another thing to point at Hillary, which is something that he's loved to do all the time, even while he is president and won. <laughs> I, I, I honestly had not thought of that. <laughs> Use the media. I, I, I've been trying to go through and, you know, no, you gotta fight dirty. different people's <laughs> web websites going, hey, guys, I feel like this st- story is undercovered. Would you please look into this? Or would you please, if, please. You, if there's somebody who is covering the story, get them in contact with me or, or show me w- within your content where I can find more information on the story. And I've gotten nothing. <laughs> no, the, the best thing would be to tweet this. At Trump and say, can you believe that they punched a Nazi? <sighs> I know. Wow. It's a complete fabrication. I know. But it'll get them to read the damn thing. <laughs> They're not going to read this. I know. This, but like, if you tweeted it. dry deposition. I know. But if you tweet it. No, it's not. That's not that dry. This is interesting, actually. Okay, this use is not, marketing terms, and you just have to start out with yeah. saying, can you believe what Crooked Hillary exactly. is getting away with, or something like that? Yes, there you go. Well, I, can you believe you what go. the Crooked DNC has done? Just BuzzFeed it. Yeah, just BuzzFeed it to Trump, and he'll eat it up. And it'll go viral right after that. I'm, I can't believe that I'm have, having to be the one that comes up with this. I feel dirty. I feel really dirty. Yeah, I feel right dirty. Sure. This is how, I need a this shower. This is how we have to fight the war. This is how we have to fight the war. Uh, Fine. I need a shower. Definitely. Um, yeah, that, this is, I mean, this is an actual deposition, which is much better than some of the things that we end up having to go through. So this yeah. is entertaining. I mean, th- this is the kind of thing that, hey, we should dramatize this and turn it into a podcast. <laughs> That'd be Again. interesting. And God, it, it, I find that interesting. I need another hobby. Also, I mean, another <laughs> thing that just going by, by the DNC's lawyer is trying to deflect the DNC's responsibility mm-hmm. um, a, as the, the, the coordinator for the Democratic Party and going that a lot of the fraud, quote-unquote, was being committed by those at the local party level. Really? Or that... We can't control what happens at the state and local level. We can't be held accountable for that. That's outside our purview. What was the bank that uh, was doing the major fraud and then blamed it on their managers? Uh, Wells Fargo. Me, uh, as well as Fargo. Kind, kind of exactly reminds me of that sort of thing. Like, well, yeah, yeah, it might have happened, but we didn't know it was the local people. It's like yeah, there was someone small enough in the way of the fire. Yeah, for like six years or something. Yeah, yeah. We didn't pay any attention to that. Uh, <laughs> some of the some of the tweets from the people that are that are following this, um, uh, RT dot com actually had a, had a pretty good article on it. Not surprising that you know a Russian news source would actually be following this fairly closely. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> uh, so far in court, the DNC's lawyers haven't denied the primary was rigged, but only argued it was their right to rig it. <laughs> That that's an easy byline to write given this deposition. Yeah, Democratic Party finally spoke the truth out loud and in public. They have no obligation to serve or interest in serving voters. Yeah. Yeah. So well, 
Uh, Bernie supporters, uh, was the primary rigged? <laughs> Worse than you think. <laughs> well, I, I, I had a pretty good idea the whole time. <laughs> it, it's just... Yeah. The, the I can understand trying to get this dismissed because this is going to really hurt the party in the long term if this gets prosecuted. However, mm-hmm. I this is your best argument for a dismissal. Dudes, so you must have committed all the bad crimes because this ain't an argument. This is a Hail Mary pass based on legalese. Yeah, so that, let's see here. Um, people paid money in, re, in reliance on the understanding that the primary elections for the Democratic nominee nominating process in 2016 were fair and impartial, the plaintiff's lawyer, uh, Jared Beck, said. And that's just not just a bedrock assumption that we would assume just by virtue of the fact that we live in a democracy and we assume that our elections are run in a fair and impartial manner. But that's what the Democratic National Committee's own charter says, and it says it in black and white. The defendants also argue that the judge cannot determine how the Democratic Party carries out its nomination process, as that would drag the court right into the political squabbles, end quote. So you're suggesting, as they continued, that this is just part of the business, so to speak, that it's not unusual for, let's say, the DNC, the RNC, to take sides with respect to any particular candidate and to support that candidate over another, Judge Zlox responded. DNC lawyer also appeared unsure of what the committee's role is, with Spriva saying he wasn't sure whether the DNC funded primaries. Judge Zlock will rule on the motion to dismiss, although a date has yet to be set. Quote, I'll be candid with you. That's going to take some time, the judge said. The legal issues are complex. Well, one of the things that <clears throat> uh, I've seen in commentary is if this case goes forward, it's going to take forever because they're going to have to subpoena state by state. Yeah, the suit will go into discovery phase. And that is where all the money gets poured into, because Discovery is pulling all the documents from everybody's computer. It's coming up with all the warrants and the wiretaps and everything, all the little gory details about a case, all of it. And it's going to take forever. Yeah. Uh, If the case isn't dismissed, the suit will go into Discovery phase. Uh, which would include depositions from Wasserman Schultz and others before proceeding to trial. It is then that the evidence from WikiLeaks uh, and others would be presented. So, yeah, WikiLeaks would end up being in discovery. Yes. See, I think the, the, the poor emails player. and everything else, all yeah. the gory details. Yeah. I hope it happens. It, it, well, see, here's the thing to worry about, I suppose. I mean, it, it would probably be great. For uh, you know, well, and and I mean that sarcastically. As far as uh, great, because it's going to take. Two, <laughs> I mean, it, like you said, it's going to take a really long time, just in yeah. time for the re-election, or just in time for the mm. the you know, midterms, Longer. when the case is then going to be public. Uh, L- honestly, longer. the I I figure on the discovery process taking at least three years. This is going to actually affect the, a a presidential senatorial and house I, elections. I if 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 we're going to be putting out estimates if we're going to make predictions on this I'm going to say that if it goes forward with trial and they have to start pulling in all the information into discovery it's going to take 10 years. Really? It's going to take a decade? Yeah. I think this is a, I think this is a 10-year case. Wow. Well, you just know that it's going to, you know, they're not, like you said, it's being sidetracked now and, you know, it's not coming out very often. But around election season, I'm sure Republicans aren't going to be afraid to to mention this. If they remember it. If they remember. <laughs> it, again, yeah. this, this was buried. It, I, it didn't even come out on Trash Day. It came out the day after Trash Day and was buried. Okay. I mean, that's the minefield. <laughs> if you want to walk across it, I, I would worry about that. Uh, honestly, well, no, it's, I, I, we are worried no, about I, that. <laughs> I, 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 I'm concerned about this because I want justice served, yeah. and I feel like 
we are it, we are not trying to sweep this under the rug. Interest to miscarry this justice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, and I, I want this brought to light. I, I think I think the best play for them um, is just to try to get it over with as quick as possible. Like be as cooperative, and then be done with it. No, maybe, no, maybe. no. again, it, it, the the. The legal process here is drag it out as long as possible mm-hmm. because the institution has a longer lifespan than the plaintiffs. The, the deal with a long discovery process is that it is, it's a war of attrition. The more documents that you have to subpoena, the more it costs. Okay. That's, this is when it comes into whose pile of papers is taller. Mm-hmm. It's all because the discovery phase, and every page of that was billable hours, and a lot yeah. of them. And these are expensive lawyers. Mm-hmm. So it, what it's going to come down to is who runs out of money first and lets it go. It's not going to be the DNC. Because the DNC is constantly getting more money. Also, if they were forced to pay this out, it would be an amazing sum. No, no, no. It's not pay it out. It's who the hell would they pay it to? But that would be be in discovery. That they frauded. Yeah, but that would be in discovery, and that would be the kind of thing that they're probably already doing the calculus on right now to figure out whether or not they can just settle out of court. Because that it would, would be, in, it, it would be in the DNC's best interest to settle out of court. The question is, what kind of terms would be agreeable? So they have to come to terms with that. So as soon as it, it's either going to take ten years. One side running out of money, or as soon as it goes to trial and they start the discovery process, the DNC magically settles it out of court and it goes away. And then the people that do get money are under NDA and will never say anything about it again. I see this going to court before it actually gets settled. One, just because of how much money they're going to have to muster right then. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, no, it wouldn't be a right then kind of thing. They They would do some sort of settlement agreement kind of thing. But there'd be so much money that they would have to produce. I mean, I'd get some money out of it. Um, you know, it's, it's weird. It's really weird. And, and would they only have to pay out the money that the DNC shelled out, that, that they collected? Or would they also have to then do a, a funds matching for whatever Bernie brought in on his own? I, I think because of defrauding, they would have to pay that penalty as well. See, that that's why the judge said it's going to take a while. Because we, you know, we've, we've already spent just five minutes looking at it, and it's like, yeah, that's, that's complicated. Also, beyond that, this would set, I mean, this is a case where the judge will literally, depending on how much long they want to stay on the bench, their entire career will be haunted by this case one way or another because this will set very strong, very careful legal precedent because it will literally go, hi, are you an organization that has a charter? If he says the case goes forward and everything else, it means you can be legally held accountable for what is in your charter. Oh, yes. But you know what? I think most organizations already think that because you're supposed to be. Though, because your charter, your articles of incorporation, as it were, they're filed along with your company filings to the government. That is the understanding by which you operate. But then think about it. If he goes, if they throw it out, that means that you can put whatever you want in your charter. You're not expected to have to follow it. Yeah. If they dismiss the case, it's your charter means nothing. Oh, yeah, integrity works. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Judge William J. Zlock, uh, born 1944 in Fort Lauderdale, senior United States District Judge, as well as a former American football quarterback and wide receiver for Notre Dame. Um, following the departure, 
of the Heisman Trophy winner. Okay, anyway, I don't really care about all that. Uh, on October 9th, 1985, President Ronald Reagan named nominated Zlock to the newly created seat on the United States District Court for the Southern District of Florida. So he's been there ever since Reagan put him there. It's heard a lot of cases then. Mm-hmm. Uh, U- UBS whistleblower Bradley Birkenfeld. Interesting. Okay, oh. so he's he's already had some very interesting cases go past him. Uh, so this will be just another one. Um, yeah. Okay, I think that's well, I feel um, mildly better in just getting that out there. Yeah, <laughs> it has now been on one news source. <laughs> well, well <laughs> aside from Russian media, it's on it's on awesome. several. CNN had it too, so you know it's it's out there. Fortune. No, it, not Fortune. That's Jared Kushner. Go away. I don't want to talk about him anymore. <laughs> yeah, no, anyway. no. Kushner features more prominently in the media than, than this does. Yeah, but he's also ridiculously wealthy. So, of course, he will. That's the world we live in now. <sighs> so, <clears throat> I think that's going to wrap it up. So, Mr. True Love, what do you think? What uh, what would you like our our generally very progressive liberal audience to to know? What what do you what do you want to give them as a takeaway? And I hope you'll come back and give more opinions. Yeah, I'm hoping to be more regular. Um, Metamucil that'll that'll help you with that. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Phillips. <laughs> but uh, you know, just just um, I, I think you know. The, the only thing things get better is if, if we open dialogues with people that don't agree with us. And sometimes that's going to be awkward. Sometimes that's going to be hard. Sometimes you're going to have to go out of your comfort zone a little bit. I don't uh, generally like to be on, uh, you know, things like this at all. So this is a step. But, you know, we each have a responsibility, if you care about this place, uh, to to do what we can to make it better. And, and, and it's just going to keep going the way it is unless people decide to do something about it. So I hope to be back and hope to give some counterpoints and maybe we can make a few little bridges even. So, But not trying to change anyone else's mind. Just want you to see a not-so-extreme side of what conservatives might think sometimes. I can dig it. I can't wait until him and Dave are on the same show. Oh, oh yeah. D- Dave's, Dave's a fun guy. He's a fun guy. <laughs> he, uh, he's a resident conspiracy professor. He's gone beyond theories at this point. Let's be honest here. <laughs> he has a tinfoil hat. <laughs> he, he calls it theory like gravity's a theory. No, 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 <laughs> no, no. The, the, the... <laughs> oh, good gods! I also have a tinfoil hat, but mine's a pyramid. Uh, yours is much bigger. <laughs> Shwa- well, no, remember that is the wo- royal hat of Swami Pastrami. Ah, yes, well, Swami the, Pastrami. Yes. At the very beginning of the show, I was told that size matters. So, <laughs> and he does currently have the biggest hat. This is the biggest hat. Well, you know, all religions, you know, have hats. So, I, I suppose that uh, the the conspiracy theorist uh, that that can be a religion at some point. So, I might as well have a hat too. So, tinfoil it is. That's so very progressive. Maybe, thinking ahead. Uh, yep. Yeah, there you go. Absolutely. Uh. Got to got to think ahead. So, it's it's the world we live in. Okay, so, uh, gentlemen, um, this would be the, uh, a wonderful time for any picks or nitpicks or any uh, pick of the week kind of thing that you happen to have. Uh, over uh. the last, yeah, over the last week, I have read the first three books in the Expanse series. Oh, my. You've I've, been binging. I've been binging. I want the next one. <laughs> so um, It's out there. I know. I just I, I ran out of audible audible credits, uh, so I'm just just waiting for it to repopulate, and then I had to go through my podcast list. And it's like, yeah, I gotta I gotta work on that too. So I gotta go back and forth. But yeah, a lot of my my overtime is just driving, so I get to read a lot. So hence Audible. Uh, the The Expanse series is really just well done. There's so much intrigue involved in it that I'm not going to say anything beyond that because I would spoil it. So I, I'm i a big fan of reading the book before watching whatever the uh, visual adaption of it might be. And we got a couple seasons of The Expanse right now, already, mm-hmm. out there. So 
I'm itching to watch that, but I wanted to read through the books first, and I, I recommend that you do the same. So, it's the Expanse series as uh, James Corey, and it's wonderful, wonderful stuff. So, it looks like, Stephen, you've got one that you just uh, dropped here in the chat. Yep, I recently had to decide, okay, my old mouse has been around long enough, it has the Battlefield 2152 logo on it, it was the special edition for that, to give you an idea of how old it is. Um, I said, okay, let me look around and find a decent mouse to do. I don't want to spend an ungodly amount, but I'm an online gamer and I need freaking buttons, but not too many because I also do other things like writing. So I found this mouse I've been looking at for a while, the Logitech G502 Proteus Spectrum RGB tunable gaming mouse. Um, that's a mouthful. I actually, it, it's a mouthful. Um, one of the things I liked about the, the old Logitech had a G5, uh, was it actually had weights in it. So you could literally change how the mouse felt and like which side it pulled to, how heavy it was, how light it was, etc. This one has the same one, only it's got more of them. Example that I'm running every single weight I currently have now. And I like the weight and feel of this mouse. Um, it's got multiple buttons, very easy to use. And this is actually also, you can change the color on it and actually make it uh, just go through an entire spectrum or stay on a single color. It's got a full color wheel. Uh, Logitech has a program that they have for it. So you can literally, you can build up to three profiles, which you can change on the fly with a button press on the mouse where the buttons then do different things depending on what profile you're on. So I'm doing regular messing around with the computer stuff. Okay, well, now I want to jump into, say, uh, one of my online games, like MechWarrior Online. Well, okay, I've, I I assign like eight different weapons, okay, and each one is a different button. Well, good news. I've got a profile that says each of these weapons now has a button that I can just go that weapon, that weapon, that weapon. So I love the feel of it. Um Again, it's a good weighty mouse. It doesn't feel like it's going to fly off anywhere. Um, it feels solid. The clicks, I mean, this is not a mouse that you keep around, especially clicking-wise, when you have to maintain absolute silence because it's a solid click, right-click or left-click at this point. I gotcha. mean, even the, uh, even the mouse wheel is actually a pretty good solid chunk. Kathunk, 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 yeah. Um, one neat thing I did find out about this is the mouse wheel itself actually has two modes. It has the standard, like if you flip your mouse wheel, you, you know, you feel it go click, 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 click each time. There actually is a lock button on it where if you hit it, it unlocks that wheel and now it is free spinning. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is kind of cool. I'm like, okay, I don't really know when I'm going to use that, but neat feature. Um, right now they're on Amazon for about 60 bucks. Uh, so far I've had it for... About a little over a week now, week, week, two weeks, and I'm enjoying the mouse. It's plenty usable, great for gaming. I don't have any complaints about it whatsoever. We'll see how it is in six months. <laughs> nice. There's even a lighting sleep timer. Yes. That's handy. Okay. And it uh, looks like you uh, you beat the rush because it will be back in stock uh, May 9th. So yeah. if you happen to be watching now, then you might want to wait a little bit and then you'll be able to find it. So I'll have, a, I'll have a link out to that. The Logitech G502 Proteus Spectrum RGB Tunable Gaming Mouse First Person Shooter Orientation. Of course, I also have to cheat because there's an Amazon Depot not that far from me in the state and I was able to get it like the next day. Oh yeah. 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 For free. Like same day shipping kind of stuff. Yeah. I'm like, Oh, it's free. Cause I have prime click. Thank you. Oh, and there it is. Yep. Ah, oh, that's nice. I maybe, I don't know. Hmm. It's not bad. It, it, it's got a good hand feel too. Interesting stuff. So, all right, Daniel, do you have anything? I, I had an aha moment today Aha. actually okay there are some things that should be obvious but they're not until you stumble across them yeah i know how that like is. <clears throat> the english museum has a channel on youtube um okay and you have my attention i have a fondness for board games i also have a fondness for history 
And through these two things, I, I found the English Museum, and apparently the oldest board game that we have the rules to. Okay. Uh, it is the Royal Game of Ur, also known as 20 Boxes. Um, it is, as I, I explained to Steve, um, and he refers to it as the first and most ancient of Mario Karts. Um, <laughs> okay. Because it is a racing game. Uh, you have this one uh, field where uh, you each have uh, representations for nine chariots. And you are rolling dice. These are D4s, by the way, that have one pip, one little white pip at the end of, of one of its segments to signify that you've scored a point. You can move one your chariots a number equal to the points you have scored. Now, both sides have a neutral track to start with, and then they must share a track. Now, if you land on their chariot, you push it off the track, they have to go back to the beginning. So you have to score all nine of yours and be the first one to do so to win. Uh, now, this is the simple game mode. Apparently, since this was the national game of Mesopotamia, uh, it was played for quite some time, and the rule book that is extant is a cuneiform tablet that explains the more advanced rules because everyone understood the basic ones. Oh, I can see it on Kickstarter now. You, too, can have the original cuneiform tablet version <laughs> as one of the uh, well, backer levels. <laughs> in, in this cuneiform with the, the advanced rules, it was from one... Mesopotamian philosopher who most of his actual genuine friends were Greek. And so he's explaining the finer details of the game to them and how it's played in Mesopotamia. Which, uh, if I remember the dialogue precisely from the curator, a, 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 a Mr. Finkel. Um, That's a great name for a curator. Go, mm -hmm. Goes over that, uh, yes, they would most often bet on, you know, drinks. Occasionally, women. Um, when it Why comes not to both? Playing this game. <laughs> uh, so, it is, it is this delightful ancient dice game that uh, we actually know Toot Uncommon actually played this. So, if you want to have something in common with a pharaoh, try and find this game. Uh, but and here, I just it, wanted to be buried in a pyramid. <laughs> um, but the other thing that I can st stress to you about is th this, this led me down a rabbit hole that is the, the English museum, uh, and their, their YouTube site and learning just <laughs> the wealth of stuff that they have there on, on this channel. Like, hi, yes, I would like to know more about the bronze age, please click. Um, <laughs> okay. And, <laughs> we can do that. Here you go. Uh, <laughs> and finding out that, yes, they had a form of political protest in the Bronze Age. It was making a bronze dirk and, you know, in a religious ceremony, shoving this non-weapon-grade dirk, because it had not been sharpened, it was much heavier. Mm -hmm. But as a representation of war and conflict, you, you purchased this thing and then you shoved it in and buried it in the ground. I wonder how effective a protest that really is. I think I'm good with marches at this point. But it's no, a final it, thing. It, 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 you just that sort of story and, and, and all the things that have been going down. So I highly suggest the, 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 the English Museum channel on YouTube. It's a treasure trove of information. It's presented not quite so dryly as you would expect. Um also, I have found beard goals. Mr. Finkel has a, a magnificent, like, wiry white beard. Um, but it also, again, there's this beautiful thing of, of gaming that has been a part of human existence since the city of Ur. Just remember, huh. Mario Kart, ruining friendships for 5,000 years. Apparently. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, and you were right, it is Finkel, but in, in true gamer style, the most appropriate name for 
any curator of a museum, especially in Britain, would be Irving Finkel. That is his name, Irving Finkel. Dr. Uh, Irving Finkel. Dr. Irving uh, Finkel. Uh, uh, Jeez. Fluent and cuneiform. Of course he is. Of course. And also had the, the pulp... The stereotype. Like, <laughs> the pulp childhood uh, British Museum movie thing. He, he went as a child and went there, and then something went, I want to be the museum curator. And guess what he became? <sighs> Yeah. Uh, stereotypes actually, exist for a reason some of those reasons are Dr. Irving Finkel <laughs> uh, and no it, it, the, the guy is a definite character and I, I'm, I've seen a couple more videos of his in fact uh, one uh, of a mild religious bent was um, he actually encountered a tablet that uh, speaks of you know the biblical flood but puts it in an entirely different time period. Of course it does. Why not? <laughs> so I, 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 found, I found that interesting. You can follow his research, which is all specializing in Middle Eastern study, uh, through, through the English Museum channel there on, on YouTube. They also have stuff on, you know, ancient Rome, uh, Anything that the British Museum contains. So if you're uh, an Egyptophile, there's tons. So and I, I will have I will have a link to uh, Doctor Irving Finkel's uh, video on the royal game of Ur in the show notes, along with uh, links to everything else that we that we've been chatting about, at least as best as I can possibly muster. It, it's a hoot. It's also the first board game that actually came with a drawer. To go with its pieces. Ooh, fancy! No, it really, it really was. It, it's this fancy. That's right. Pinky's out. It's the fanciest thing. Very fancy. And Very fancy. Yet it was an easy, quick enough pickup game that he talks. Because if you actually go to that specific uh, article there on YouTube, he's playing against a guy who he's instructed in the rules for like fifteen minutes, and he picks it right up. Excellent. That's wonderful. Okay, that's a good pick. There's a lot, lot there, lot to unpack on that one. But you're famous for things that we have to unpack. So <laughs> the entire British good. Museum, in this case. Yes. The, <laughs> let's unpack the entire Brit. No, stop it. <laughs> We're not doing that. Nope. No. No. And no. But he and has 130,000 cuneiform tablets, man. Of course he does. He, he goes on this actually a number of times. And he's read them all twice. Ah. Uh, well. He's that much of a geek. Of course. I, again, I was like, well, why wouldn't he? Well, why wouldn't he? Okay, so let's see if I can uh, if I can pull up the link that Mr. True Love has given me here. Sure, I saw something as well. The so, Benchmade I, Saddle? Yep. yep. Uh, well, Saddle Knife. It's um, a knife I carry with me all the time. Uh, everyone that knows me with this knife. It, uh, yeah. I have a few knives. This is... My knife, like the other ones, are my junk knives. This is my <laughs> special knife. Um, so I just thought I would share that with everyone else. If you're looking for a reliable, reliable knife, I've been using it a lot during this move. Um, keep mine. It's pretty simple to fit in the pocket. It uh, has lasted me two years. Has not lost much of the edge at all. Uh, you know, don't even have to sharpen it as long as you're not crazy with it. Uh, and it was famous when I moved here two years ago because. I could simply rest it on a box, and it would already cut in. Um, so it's, Jeez. It's, it's, it's been a very reliable knife. Uh, it's American company, American Steel. Um, so, yeah, if anyone is in the market for a good knife to carry with you camping around the house, this is the one I recommend. This is the one I carry around. So, The Saddle Mountain Hunter. Um, yep, it comes. I like the brown, but you can't go wrong with the colors, so. There you go, and it, it's uh, it's not a folding knife, so it's very very strong. The blade oh. actually runs all the way through the hilt here. Okay, but it full comes tank. with a very nice sheath. Mm-hmm. Full I'm tank. I think they call that full tank construction. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Correct. <laughs> Fixed blade. Mm. So what's the what's the blade? Go back up, Andy, for a second. What's the blade length? Uh, overall length is eight point five nine inches, or twenty one centimeters, almost twenty two centimeters. The blade length is 4.05 inches, 
Or, and because uh, of that point zero five inches, technically, it's an open carry in the state of Florida. Mm-hmm. I, I, I carry it sticking out because yeah, you don't want to conceal carry. So, but uh, has to be over it, four it, inches for open carry. <laughs> just is just is that much? It's, oh, it's so small. But yeah, there you are. <laughs> Smaller than that it doesn't matter. You can open carry or close, but you, it, you can't hide longer than that. But it's like yay. Unless you're Duncan McLeod or something, you know, then, then you can hide whatever you want. No, that man has, <laughs> that man has extra dimensional friggin' yeah, trench coat. No, <laughs> exactly. It, it, where did you it, put it, that katana? I mean, really, where was that a second ago? It, it it does fit completely in my pocket, but it does come with a sheath with a carrying loop as well. I check your state law. I checked Florida law, but uh, it varies by state on what what kind of blade you can carry. Yeah. But if it is allowed in your state, this is one that I I personally have had a lot of good use with. And the experience with the company has been good as well. My dad used to sell knives, and he can tell you that the company was was very good to uh, deal with if you ever had a problem. So. Okay, so that's Benchmade, the Saddle Mountain Hunter family knife. Nice. At a cool $150. But uh, you say you just quality. rested yeah. it on a box and it cut the box. That's that's sharp. That. It- it it holds an edge, and if you're you're interested in buying American made, American built, here you go. Amazing, that's nice. Okay, so sheath weight, the diamond wood handle weight is three point five eight ounces, or one hundred and one grams. So that's it's good, good solid knife right there. I like that. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Adding and that to his see. Christmas wish list. I'm, I may. <laughs> I may do that. But you can find that, again, in our show notes, available out on com for show 153. And with that, I believe, gentlemen, we've, we've completed the show. We've completed the show. Any last-minute words of wisdom to impart to our audience? Contact your congressman early and often. That also goes for your local paper. Every I found two days. Remember to call them. Found it interesting that Bill Posey's office was not taking any calls previously to the uh, to the last health care vote, but after that, uh, they was taking calls all of a sudden. Hmm, shocking. Hmm. So, maybe send some postcards. They work too, you know. Okay. Also, pizzas and faxes. Yeah, yeah. Just expect that fax machine to take a while. <laughs> it's got to process also probably remember, a lot of them. The greatest thing I've seen people do. Especially if it's something like, you know, all these lawmakers who are hardcore, you know, defunding Planned Parenthood. You are allowed to donate to Planned Parenthood in their name, and they will then receive a thank you letter for the donation. Or yeah, yeah. That also goes for the National Suicide Prevention Hotline and a number of other charities. So if you want to troll some people while doing something positive... That's a great way to do it. There are ways to do that whole passive aggressive trolling thing. Yes, you can do it. You you too can make a difference. <laughs> Love it. So Yes, thumbs up. Okay. All right. If you've enjoyed what we've done here and you'd like to help us out, there's a few ways you can do that. You can donate to the show through www.patreon.com slash O-R-L-Y-R-A-D-I-O. That's patreon.com slash O'Reilly Radio. And get early access to full show content and show notes and anything else I can think to give you that I don't give the normal people. Uh, Also, you can make the algorithms work for us by reviewing us on iTunes. That'll boost our ranking, get us in front of new people. And, uh, hey, use your words. Tell somebody about us, because word-of-mouth advertising is always the best, no matter what. And, of course, engage us directly. Send us a message or on the social medias or the electronic mails at Podcast at gmail.com. Or if they're more talkative sort, we got that voice line, 470-222. O R L Y, that's 6759. It's always ready to take your call or your text. Would anyone like to say it? No? Okay. (laughs) No problem. If you don't like what we've done here this evening, you can contact the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1 800 273 8255. Available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The Lifeline provides free and confidential support for people in distress prevention and crisis resources for you and your loved ones and best practices for professionals thank you for choosing to waste your valuable time on us this has been a really radio part of the random acts company this work is licensed under creative
Commons Attribution 3.0 United States license, including the Music Rocket and Pemgea, created by Kevin McLeod of Encomptech.com. We'll see you next week. Thanks, everybody. Doodles! Hey.